Good afternoon. Are the uh, everybody who needs a headset pedevochki katovi? Da. Okay. So welcome to uh, session number one. I'm Michael Lopez Alegria, and I will be moderating this uh, panel of august guests. Um, the session of this, uh, the title of this session is the uh, impact of Apollo today and tomorrow. And we're going to have a little retrospective of the uh, Apollo program told um, not so much technically, but focusing a little bit more on the uh, cultural and social impact. And to help me do that, I have three uh, esteemed panelists, which I would like to start introducing and keeping with the adage, age before beauty. <laughs> Sorry, Wayne. <clears throat> A name that is uh, familiar to anybody, uh, any of the astronauts that flew at NASA in the last several decades, Mr. Wayne Hale. He has a bachelor's degree of mechanical engineering from Rice University and a master's um, in mechanical from Purdue. He joined NASA at JSC in 1978, right after he graduated. He was a, a space shuttle systems flight controller for 15 flights, starting with STS-1. From 1988 to 2003, he was a flight director assigned to a record 40 space shuttle flights, at least one of them on one I was on. Uh, in 2003, after the Columbia accident, he joined the senior leadership of the program office, first as a launch integration manager at KSC, and then deputy program manager for two years, followed by two years as the Space Shuttle Program Manager. In 2008, he became Deputy Associate Administrator of Strategic Partnerships at NASA Headquarters, where he supported the Augustine Committee and was a principal architect in the formulation of Commercial Crew Program. He retired in 2010 and is currently the Chairman of the Human Exploration and Operations Committee of the NASA Advisory Council, where he is my boss. And he served as a member of the FAA's Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee. His day job is Director of Human Spaceflight for Special Aerospace Services in Boulder, Colorado. They provide services in technical analysis, engineering consulting, mishap reviews, management and organizational reviews and coaching, seminars and speaking engagements with aerospace energy and other high reliability organizations on safety, management, culture change, and operations in high-risk environments. Please, Mr. Wayne Hale. Uh, next, a person who is probably a little less familiar uh, to you, but uh, I think you'll agree that her biography is quite impressive. Dr. Jennifer Levasseur received her BA in history from the University of Michigan in 1999 a master's in American studies from the George Washington University, and a PhD in history at George Mason University. Her book is about to come out, which is called Through Astronaut Eyes, Photographing Early Human Space Flight, and it looks at the cultural significance of astronaut photography. She serves as a responsible curator for museums, astronaut cameras, chronographs, the Space Shuttle International Space Station, and she's replacing a person that many of you know, uh, Dr. Valerie Neal. I don't think we've said your affiliation, but this is the National uh, Air and Space Museum and the Smithsonian Institution. So for over 17 years, Jennifer worked on the museum programs, including artifact loans, digital projects, and is the committee, program committee chair for the museum's biennial Mutual Concerns of Air and Space Museums Conference. She curated the 2015 anniversary exhibit Outside the Spacecraft, 50 Years of Extravehicular Activity, and currently serves as the exhibition curator for the Moving Beyond Earth exhibit on the Shuttle and Space Station era. Dr. Lavasser. <laughs> and finally, a much more brief introduction, since we all know him well, Dr. Tom Jones. Um, He's a scientist, pilot, author, veteran NASA astronaut, flew four times on the space shuttle and helped deliver the U.S. Destiny Laboratory to the ISS. He's done three spacewalks uh, during his visit to the ISS during Expedition 1. 
He spent 53 days living and working in space, and he now writes and speaks on human space exploration, planetary defense from asteroids, where he's a big spokesman for the Association of Space Explorers and the Future of Space Resources. PJ. All right, so if we could have the first slide. This is what the moon looked like for about the first 100,000 years of Homo sapiens existence uh, on the planet. And some events later in the last century uh, started to change that look, uh, or at least our approach to it. The first was the launch of Sputnik, October 4th, 1957. Uh, this was the uh, beeping that was heard around the world that launched a bit of a space race between the Soviet Union, who launched this vehicle, and the United States. The person behind that, and indeed behind uh, the first um, cases in the Soviet program, was Sergei Pavlovich Karolyov, a uh, hero of the Soviet Union, uh, eminent rocket designer and space architect. Meanwhile, on this side of the pond, we had a different gentleman. Not that one, this one. This is uh, Dr. Werner von Braun. Uh, and so these two gentlemen sort of led their respective uh, countries uh, toward the moon. Uh, this is the first class of uh, Soviet cosmonauts, uh, 20 folks chosen in 1960. And actually, a year before that, the Mercury 7 were chosen here at NASA in 1959. So the difficult choice of whom to fly as the first cosmonaut or astronaut in each country's respective astronaut corps was obviously a very uh, challenging and delicate one. I certainly don't know the ins and outs of how it happened in the Soviet Union, but the story that is often told is that Yuri Gagarin was chosen for his smile. Back here in this country, we had a gentleman of a different sort named Alan Shepard. But it was not Alan Shepard. It was Yuri Gagarin who, in, on April 12th in 1961, became the first human being to enter space. And not only did he enter space, he orbited the Earth uh, and did one revolution, taking off and landing in Kazakhstan. Whereas in this country, Alan Shepard, a little more appropriately dressed here, um, launched on uh, May 5th in 1961 and did three orbits, uh, I'm sorry, on a suborbital mission, um, still quite a lower achievement than what the uh, Soviets had done. Not too many days later, um, John F. Kennedy addressed the Congress, a joint session of Congress, and he said, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing man having a hard time with this, I apologize, landing man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Um, so John Glenn then became the first American to do an orbital flight of, of the of the Earth. Uh, he did three uh, revolutions, landed in the Atlantic Ocean, and not long after that, John F. Kennedy addressed um, the public here in Rice University in um, Houston and challenged us to go to the moon um, in this decade, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. He said there is no strife. No prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. Its hazards are hostile to us all. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind, and its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. He said, we, go, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and to do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they are hard, and because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, 
and one we intend to win. But a few things had to happen before man could go to the moon. One of them was we had to learn how to operate outside the spacecraft in the vacuum of space. That, that feat was accomplished by our dearly passed uh, Alexei Arhipovich Leonov, who performed the fir first spacewalk on March 18th, um, 1965. It lasted 12 minutes and nine seconds, and if those of you who haven't heard the story, it was quite a harrowing feat. Uh, but he was the first, and uh, he will be memorialized forever for that. But the next was Ed White, who did it on June 3rd, 1965, outside the spacecraft. The second thing that had to be demonstrated was the ability to rendezvous between two aircraft, or I should say, two spacecraft in space. And that was done on, uh, with the, in the Gemini program between two Gemini vehicles. So things were moving along quite quickly. Uh, the first people to see the view of the Earth like this uh, were on Apollo 8 in uh, December of 1968. This is a famous, uh, actually this flight photo is not from that flight, but it's representative of what they saw. And then finally on June uh, sorry, on July 16th in 1969, the launch of the Saturn V um, with the three crew member who, who would eventually go to the moon. That was on uh, the 16th at about 1.30 uh, GMT, so about 9.30 in the morning here. And they detached uh, from the LEM, and what I like to now ask the panelists to get involved is, um, you know, it, this, this eventually led to landing on June, July 20th. Um, everybody has a story about where they were when that happened. My story is I was an 11-year-old kid. I was in Southern California at the beach with my family, and uh, all of a sudden, for some reason, the adults started calling the kids to get out of the water, and we were all huddled around our blankets listening to transistor radios as we could hear, you know, the final um, few minutes of the descent to the surface and the famous words about Tranquility Base, the Eagles landed. And then something really interesting happened. Uh, first of all, I, it might be urban legend because I, I, maybe I just believe this now because I've told the story, but I swear to God the waves quieted down so we could all hear the last few minutes. And secondly, <clears throat> these adults, many of whom were complete strangers, were hugging each other and slapping each other on the back like they had been old friends forever. And it was this, for an 11-year-old, that was quite a, an emotional and, and uh, impactful moment for me. And I'd like to ask the three of you, starting with you, Wayne, um, where you were and what you were thinking. Well, I was, uh, so I was in secondary school, and uh, I had been, a, I guess you'd call it a space cadet from Sputnik on, inspired by all the events of the space age, decided I wanted to work in space, followed it closely, bus, bus dock, Gemini, Mercury, bus god, Soyuz. And, and uh, so to me, this was the culmination. And I watched it at, in my home, on the television, and uh, got together with my teenage friends later. And uh, we were just astounded that this event had actually taken place in our lives. Jennifer, I'm going to skip you because I suspect that you have a different kind of answer, but go ahead, Tom. I was a couple years older than Wayne, and I was on a family vacation from Maryland all the way to California and back with my family. And so I was following the space program very carefully and, and enthusiastically. I had scrapbooks full of newspaper clippings of all the space achievements uh, around the world and this build up to the Apollo 11 mission was very much on my mind as we went across the country with no television. And so here are my three brothers and sisters and I and my parents in a station wagon with a camper pulled behind the station wagon driving across the country. When it got to July 20th and the actual landing we were in Southern California so I wasn't very far from you. So we were on the roadside headed into the Los Angeles area at about four in the afternoon or whatever it was when the landing occurred out there. And um, the uh, landing, of course, there was no video. So listening to it on a transistor radio wasn't so bad. That's what Wayne's uh, 
colleagues in, in Mission Control would have been doing at the same time. And it was quite exciting to see the landing, or to hear the landing and, and visualize it in your mind. And I was really enthralled by the drama of the touchdown. Then we'd been camping our way across the country, and there was no prospect of having a, a TV in our, in our trailer. We didn't have that. But I implored my parents, please, can we go to a motel tonight so we can watch the moonwalks? And they were nice enough to bring the family to a motel in Anaheim where we watched the, the first uh, steps on the moon that evening. And after the first few minutes, all my brothers and sisters ran out and jumped in their swimming pool while I was left alone in the, in the motel room to watch the two hours of the moonwalk. So that was really a, 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 an event that cemented my interest in space and helped me fix on a space career in the future. Really a, a momentous moment in my life growing up. Jennifer, was it a momentous moment in your life? Well, I can't say that because I wasn't born yet, but uh, so that makes me identify with some of the folks in the back of the room, I think, who won't have a personal memory of Apollo. Um, strangely enough, my, my, my own family legends, the, the stories I heard growing up, um, also connect to Southern California. My mother was on a family trip with, uh, with her parents and her brothers, and uh, they were at Disneyland that day. And Disneyland put out, of course, being as attached as they were to spaceflight and the imagination of spaceflight, put screens out for all of their visitors to watch the moon landing. And so she was also in Anaheim, California, watching those same moments. And I heard about those, having grown up during the space shuttle program, heard about that moment from my mother for many, many years. And I think likewise was inspired by it to find a way to make it a part of my life uh, as a career and kind of led me down the path to working at the museum. And so I've, I've taken it in a different direction, and I think, um, you know, as one to think about and consider as we talk here today is about the generations who won't have, who don't have living memories of the Apollo program and how we continue to tell those stories to future generations. So I'm going to break your concentration here, Mike, and just say that um, my goal was always to work in mission control because I had very bad eyes, and I knew I wouldn't make an astronaut. But the first time I got to walk in mission control and sit at the very same consoles that the Apollo flight controllers sat at during the historic moon landing was like being in a holy place. You felt like you should take your shoes off. <laughs> and just, and just uh, it's unbelievable. And, and I know it's on the tour for the companions uh, to go see that restored room. But to have actually been able to operate in that place was a fulfillment of a dream. So these next couple of images are um, are kind of meant to evoke the the times, both in fashion and, and other things. And um, Wayne, I'm going to come to you in a second to ask you about the state of technology at the time and how sort of miraculous it was that um, what was achieved was actually achieved. Uh, back then. Sorry, I'm going to leave it on this one. Go ahead, Wayne. <laughs> so, you know, a, electronics are not where they are today. Um, the thought that you could actually build a computer that would fly on a spacecraft um, that could go to the moon that wasn't a room full of uh, vacuum tubes was just almost unbelievable. Um, the, uh, the, the sheer power of the rocket um, was uh, unbelievable and unmatched. Um, there were plenty of people I can remember that thought that it was just an impossible feat. As a matter of fact, I think one of the things you have to know about the times is the phrase, you might as well wish for the moon, was the phrase that people used to describe the impossible, something that would never happen, not in the whole history of mankind. So to actually have the technology in hand to be able to go there um, was, was incredible. And, of course, those of us that were following very closely watched both watched the, com the competition, the race, between the Soviet Union and the United States and know that the Zond missions right before Apollo 8 circled the moon and, and, uh, and, the, and the, both the... Both, uh, both organizations were striving to perfect their technology to go to that distance. 
So, Tom, uh, can you pick up on that and talk a little bit about this shot, which is, uh, well, I'll let you describe it. Yeah, that's the Apollo guidance computer, and you know, Jennifer owns one <laughs> back at the Air and Space Museum. Um, so they were, they were, these were the first digital computers used in human space flight, and they were um, created specifically for the, for the moon program. In fact, the first contract that NASA let in the Apollo program was for that computer, uh, the digital computer that would guide the astronauts to and from the moon. And they recognized that was the keystone of the entire effort. So it was the earliest and first contract let for Apollo. It was, it was given to the MIT uh, labs that were later called the Draper Laboratories uh, up there in Massachusetts. So over the course of the 1960s, this computer took form, um, and they made the crucial decision, the design team, to use integrated circuits rather than uh, vacuum tubes or individual transistors and, and, and components on a circuit card. They went to integrated circuits. And for the first three or four years of the effort, the uh, Apollo guidance computer effort ate up 90% of the integrated circuits that the country was producing as a whole, uh, Texas Instruments and other companies. And so um, this computer was revolutionary in many respects in, in that, yes, it's a digital computer. It had a, a low cost and – I'm sorry, not low cost. <laughs> that was unconstrained. It had, <laughs> it had low size and power consumption to fit in the Apollo spacecraft and to fit within the electrical budget. It um, was also single strain. There were no backup computers. It was just one computer in the command module, one in the lunar module. And so here for the first time you had a digital computer in space that not only was essential for mission success, but it was essential for the safety of the humans on board. Human life relied upon this machine working to perfection. And as we all know from watching the documentaries all, of, all this year and perhaps having seen that excellent new documentary called Apollo 11, you see the drama in the lunar descent when the computer begins to generate program alarms during descent as it was bombarded with extraneous information from the, the rendezvous radar. That's a story for another day. But this machine didn't give up the ghost and fail during lunar descent. Instead, it did what it was supposed to do, was drop the non-critical tasks and stay focused on the job of trying to land the lunar module with the pilots, of course, assisting with Neil and Buzz flying the machine. So this was a revolutionary machine. It really um, brought a new level of performance and reliability to computers in spaceflight. And so you might say that this computer, in its small size, in its digi digital uh, operation, in its reliability, became the forerunner of the desktop, desktop machines that arrived about 10 years later and that began to uh, spread computer technology and make it accessible to everyone. So the fact that we live digital lives today with all of our devices that on us and, and that dominate our lives is all due to, I think, this computer and its central role in the Apollo program. So it's a marvelous, um, revolutionary piece of equipment that we're still benefiting from today. So, Jennifer, your uh, profession and your passion is photography, and miniaturization was not only, not o not only applicable to flight computers, but also to recording devices. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. I mean, the way that we all got to share in the experience of Apollo, and we'll continue to share in that, is not only through seeing some of these artifacts like the Apollo computer systems, it's also through the visual media that was created. And so in that moment, we, you all have talked, the three of my colleagues here have talked about seeing it live on television or hearing it on the radio. Um, the capability to have that experience was thanks to an incredible development uh, and miniaturization, really, of those kinds of technologies. And so this is an example, this image here, of a studio television camera from that same era. This is from the late 1960s. And to take that 400 pounds and turn it into something that could be picked up in one person's hand on the surface of the moon, to be able to have all of the people around the world see that. So it's not just the camera itself, it's the ability to send that signal back to receiving stations on the Earth and then transmit that signal back to Houston and have it go to everyone's television in their homes. It, the process of all of that and the coordination of all of that is really an incredible feat. And through the anniversary celebrations this last summer, that's something I spent a lot of time at kind of re-explaining to people, and it amazed me that nobody really um, rem seemed to remember many of these, um, the news professionals I spoke to didn't have that in their um, sort of, you know, their own personal sort of thoughts about the sort of history of conveying this story is that 
an incredible technological feat had to happen to be able to share that and broadcast that and bring that to everyone. The cameras were something that was a little slightly different. The handheld cameras were um, much more off-the-shelf design, but something brand new had to happen in terms of television and, and certainly the ability to broadcast that signal back to Earth. And so um, it's, it's, it's a, it, to make that happen in just a few years' time, I think, is um, something that, you know, like the digital computer revolution that begins with Apollo is similar with this kind of technology. Okay. Uh, thank you. Speaking of photography, this is um, being live streamed this event. And as I understand it, you have or will soon have uh, the ability to submit questions for the panelists, um, which we'll get to as soon as we're done with it. Uh, inner panel discussion. So next, um, we were about to touch down. In fact, we just touched down. And uh, a, a couple hours after the landing, um, Buzz um, Aldrin, who we're expecting a little bit later this week, got the microphone. He said, this is a lunar module pilot. I'd like to take this opportunity to ask every person listening in whoever and wherever they may be, to pause for a moment and contemplate the events of the past few hours and to give thanks in his or her own way. So next, um, they got ready for the, the first, uh, well, the only spacewalk of that flight um, by putting on their suits and reconfiguring the lunar lander. And um, Neil Armstrong started down the ladder, which was attached to one of the legs on the lunar module. And as he did, he passed this plaque. And this plaque says, here, men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon July 1969 AD. We came in peace for all mankind. And then he said, Something like one small step, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> this was uh, at about 3 in the morning GMT, so 11 o'clock on the east coast of the United States. Um, and any thoughts from the panel on what that meant to you then? You know, um, it demonstrated that uh, there was a bright future possible, I, I really think. Um, that um, I think you have to put yourself back in the mindset of the 1960s, 1950s. There was a Cold War going on. Um, I read an article at the time that said it would be 24 years from Trinity to Tranquility. Trinity, of course, on July 16, 1945, was the first atomic bomb test. And 24 years later, on July 16, 1969, astronauts took off for tranquility. And, I, and I, I think all of us that grew up in that era were terrified by the prospect of a thermonuclear war ending humanity. And there was competition, but in space, it became a peaceful competition. And later on became very much peaceful cooperation. So this image, this landing, this complete event uh, came to be a very hopeful sign, I think, for the entire generation that had grown up with this fear, knowing that the future was bright, there were good possibilities, and that, and that uh, we could work together, uh, even with people of differing nations. I remember uh, the, the saying that everybody knows, of course, you know, if we can put a man on the moon, we can do X. And that's been used in every possible <laughs> situation or criticism of our current situation on Earth. I remember we were at a, in Washington, D.C. a few years ago, we were at a Fourth of July celebration watching the fireworks on Independence Day. And at the end, there were these huge crowds getting onto the, the subway, the metro system, to go back home. And the Trains were overcrowded. People were pushing to get on the, the train, and not everybody could get on board the car. And somebody in the middle of the car yelled out, Hey, we put a man on the moon. We can do this. And everybody let their breath out and squeezed 15 more people on the subway car. So it just represents everybody's hope that we can work together 
and accomplish the seeming impossible. And that's not an American saying, it's a worldwide saying. If we can put a man on the moon, we can do X. And I, I think that 50 years later, it's still that kind of it still has that optimistic ring to it. That um, if we could do something that was deemed impossible in 1961, just eight years later, then no matter what we try, if we organize ourselves properly, if we have this, the cooperative efforts, if we find the way to get the best ideas to the forefront, if we uh, obviously provide the necessary resources, then we can do something that, um, that this country, this world needs doing. So I, I really took a lot of hope from the fact that we walked on another celestial body 50 years ago because that seemed to represent um, a limitless future for humanity. Uh, we would not be bound by our seemingly parochial boundaries. We would break those chains with the completion of the, uh, the Apollo achievement and be able to go on to something that might even be more stunning in the century ahead. And I would just say, too, about this particular image, one thing I always encourage people to do when I'm, I'm giving talks about Apollo images or just images of especially those visors, uh, anything that's got a reflection, a reflective surface in it, is taking the opportunity to look at the image for what it tells us about ourselves. Um, this is a person in a place that many of us will never get the opportunity to be. Um, so thinking about putting yourself in that person's shoes, imagining that um, it, it provides that sense of hope and inspiration by being able to do that. Looking in that visor and seeing Neil Armstrong, and actually if you have a, a high enough resolution version, I believe you can see the earth in that reflection as well. There's some, there's some symbolism in that, to think about the, the fact that Armstrong took that photo and it really is a reflection of all of the things that have happened up to that point in history and gives a, a sense of um, our ability to do great and wonderful things uh, as a as a global community, and so it's a it's a great symbol. Um, and those footprints, you know, that's one thing I like to tell people when I look at this image, especially young people, is look at those footprints, look at those boot prints. Those are still there. That's still something that you can that you could see um, on in, on the moon today. And so that evidence is there. And I think that's really powerful material to to look at. So I think we know how the story, or at least this chapter of it, ended. We, uh, the craft splashed down successfully in the Pacific Ocean, recovered by a Navy helicopter. They brought the three astronauts on board the USS Hornet. They had a quarantine period uh, for a bit, and it was celebrated all over the world. Uh, of course, newspapers in this country were uh, had it above the fold, as they say, um, and also Pravda had it below the fold, but still on the front page. And they went on a uh, tour, uh, ticker tape parades, a couple of cities here. I think all in all, they visited uh, 23 countries. They were estimated to have been seen personally by 600 million people, which is a pretty big uh, percentage of the population back then. And then, Jennifer, I'd like you to uh, comment on these uh, next few slides that are some of the reflect some of the um, artistic interpretations of what those uh, of what that accomplishment meant. Sure. So in the um, collection of the National Air and Space Museum, we have um, a, a vast selection of art, of space art in particular, uh, most of it which comes from the NASA collection. And I always find these, as, as I mentioned, about the reflection of the, in the visor, um, in, in, they're interesting points of view to think about how artists take those images and interpret them and understand them and help us understand the meaning of them in different ways. And so this painting by Robert Shore really reflects back on some of the earliest moments of thinking about spaceflight, all the way back to um, French writers of the 19th century and imagining those early um, the possibilities of traveling to the moon and, and really the reality of it that surrounds that imagination. So you've got the actual spacesuit that kind of surrounds that narrative. And so there are these um, artists who reflect on it in somewhat um, symbolic ways, and then there are some that take on a little bit more imaginative, literal interpretations of, of that moment. And so this interpretation of Earthrise from Apollo 8, um, done by an African artist, is a very interesting take on something that is familiar to so many as a particular moment in time when we began to look back and reflect upon our own Earth. And 
even in and of course i mentioned you know sort of my my era my generation the generation that grew up watching mostly the space shuttle launches we also grew up in the era of music television of m t v and m t v used so much imagery in its early years from apollo and from the space shuttle those were its opening moments on actual live television they were live they were images of space and they were comparing what they were doing to what we had done in space maybe not quite the same thing but in their minds they were making a real uh, they were making a there was a sea change it was a real movement that was changing the way we looked at a particular part of our world and so um, the, the moon man statue comes out of that same image of Buzz Aldrin on the moon um, this one happened to fly to Mir, which is in the museum's collection. And, and it's really this kind of shift that happens because of Apollo and the way we think about how space fits our lives, how we integrate it into our daily lives, how space really does influence our daily lives. And they, um, it, it penetrates even today. I think you, know, you can go on a number of different fashion designers' websites and see you know, Apollo spacesuit sweatshirts and um, influences and high-end uh, handbags that come from Apollo. And so there's been this really big movement, especially in the last few years, of celebrating all of that in really unique ways. And I think it just speaks to the effect that Apollo has had on us uh, as, a, as a culture. July 16th, 2019. You want to comment, Tom? The Smithsonian uh, Air and Space Museum in in cooperation with the, uh, the uh, National Park Service, helped commemorate the Apollo anniversary this past summer in Washington, D.C., uh, by getting an incredible show put together. It was called Go for the Moon, uh, and it was put together by a production team that I think has experience with Olympics opening ceremonies. And so what they did was projected the Saturn V rocket on the side of the Washington Monument uh, for the last few days leading up to the anniversary on July 20th. And so my family was down there on July 20th on the evening, that Saturday evening when we commemorated the actual uh, anniversary of the, moon, of the moon landing and the first moonwalk. And it's about a 17 or 18 minute show and you can see it on YouTube now. It's just Google YouTube and go for the moon. And you'll watch this show very nicely edited and put together by the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, National Air and Space Museum. Um, the night we saw the rocket, it wasn't the first night that the rocket had been up on the Washington Monument, but uh, that night there was a big thunderstorm behind the monument off in the distance. And so that dark cloud actually gave you the impression that the, the monument itself had just disappeared. And all you could see was a Saturn V rocket. I took this picture myself. That's a Saturn V, 363 feet tall, standing on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. So the young audience there, people who hadn't remembered the moon landing firsthand, they were awed and excited and uh, overwhelmed and enthusiastic in their in their witnessing of this replay of this historic event. So see it on YouTube, Go for the Moon. Anything else they should look for, Jennifer? I think that's the, the title. That was the, yeah, that was, no, that's uh, what to look for, but uh, I know that it's had a great impact. We've, our director, Dr. Ellen Stofan, has um, been in, uh, approached by people around the world, really, and, uh, and people who were able to go and, and see that moment and, and know that it really meant something to people in a, in a way I think that surprised a lot of people. I don't think that it was some, well, we, it certainly surprised a lot of people because it wasn't very public, uh, there wasn't a lot of public knowledge about it leading up to it, but it was sort of the keystone effort of the Apollo celebrations for this last year, and um, I think it, it had more than, of an impact than we even expected or hoped. Oh, yeah. Half a million people went to see it on the mall in person, and the, the thing that struck me, you know, I know what a Saturn V looks like, but this one had vapor coming out of the fuel tanks uh, against the Washington Monument there. It was alive. Very impressive. So after Apollo 11, uh, we went back to the moon six times. Uh, one of them, we didn't get to land there, but in each landing, we had sort of successively more and more ambitions, uh, first a lot more science and walking around, and then the last few missions actually had rovers, um, which completely changed the dynamic of how far away we could uh, explore. I, I don't know about you, but I would love to have been able to do something like this. Um, and we can take the rover to a nearby rock and then go for a little walk around to the other side. It was uh, really a, a pretty spectacular um, series of missions that um, left uh, uh, almost no stone unturned, at least in the, uh, in the vicinities of where they occurred. 
And speaking of stones, can you tell us about this a little bit, Jennifer? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So this is um, the, the images that preceded this particular one. I, I always, you know, reinforce the idea that they're evidence, but uh, you know, you can treat them as evidence. You can see those materials in situ. You can study those, and scientists continue to study those images. But they also can continue to study the actual samples that returned. And so this is the sample return container from Apollo 11. And so this was where the astronauts actually put the lunar material, the rocks, um, and the regolith and in sample bags and brought it back to us. This is a, a, an incredible piece of hardware if you ever get an opportunity to see one. Um, not everybody can go and see the actual samples or study the samples. Um, so you, know, you can use, uh, you can kind of see kind of vicariously through the images, but if you, you know, are interested, and this is the kind of thing that we like to talk to in terms of inspiring new generations, is that it is still possible to study these lunar samples. If you are interested in this kind of study, if you're interested in being a geologist, a lunar geologist, you can get access to these samples even today to be able to study those things that our astronauts brought back, um, that real people brought back. I think that's pretty amazing to a lot of young people. And Tom, in, in uh, all, there's about 21 and a half kilos of samples that were brought back. Um, can you comment as a scientist on the importance of those samples? Yeah, about, what, 44 pounds or so brought back by Apollo 11, and, and in total, something like 850 pounds of uh, samples brought back by all the Apollo missions. And there's some right here in this building, in the, uh, in the history gallery of Space Center Houston that you can go and check out that far away. Um, the, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, they're still producing scientific results that are new and fresh, new uh, sealed samples that have been stored for 50 years or almost 50 years have been opened and released to investigators just in the past year. Um, some of the most important findings were uh, brought back by the Apollo samples, informed by the Apollo samples, were that you know, the moon was probably formed by this giant impact uh, of a, a Mars-sized body striking the Earth 4.5 billion years ago or shortly thereafter. And so the Apollo samples gave the mineralogical evidence to that theory that backed it up, that, that brought that hypothesis out of all of the other moon-forming hypotheses and made it the standard model today. It's not uh, fully um, formed in all of its details, but it is the, the leading hypothesis today. Even more recently, uh, samples from Apollo 15, 16, and 17 have been analyzed just in the last 10 years. And where once our instrumentation was not capable of assessing very minute quantities of water in lunar samples, they turned out to be very dry from the initial analyses. But the latest analyses show down at the parts per million level that there was water deep in the interior of the moon when it was formed. And so that's a, a, a facet of the giant impact hypothesis that had not been understood before, that water was not completely vaporized and driven off from the elements that formed the moon. Instead, some was retained, some was retained in the deep interior of the moon, and then has been erupted by the early volcanism on the moon and as a, as a consequence of giant asteroid and comet impacts. So the, the water that we're searching for today at the poles of the moon uh, may not have all been delivered by comets and asteroids from later impacts. It might have come from the deep interior of the moon. And that resource, of course, is the key to our ability to explore uh, on the moon, exploit its resources, and use those water resources in the forms of propellant and breathing gases and consumables to um, catapult us farther out into the solar system. So the Apollo samples have a very direct impact on our ability now to formulate a way for humans to live permanently on the moon and then use that knowledge and experience to go on to Mars. So on um, August 1st in 1971, on Apollo 15, <clears throat> Dave Scott left uh, this small statue of it's called the Fallen Astronaut uh, on the lunar surface. And alongside is a plaque. And the plaque has the following names on it. Charlie Bassett, Pavel Belayev, Roger Chaffee, Georgi Dabovolsky, Ted Freeman, Yuri Gagarin, Ed Givens, Gus Grissom, Vladimir Kamarov, Viktor Patsyaev, Elliot C., Vladislav Volkov, Ed White, and C.C. Williams. And these are astronauts and cosmonauts who had died previous to, to this mission. And I want to ask uh, Jennifer about the statue itself, but I then I want to ask Wayne about what this sort of message is um, that sort of started out as a, comp as a competition, as a race, 
but ended up becoming maybe the seeds of a cooperative program so the small statue there in front of the plaque is is called the fallen astronaut it was designed by i believe he's a dutch artist and uh... was carried by dave scott to the surface of the moon uh... and the plaque goes along with it you can see a version of that at the air and space museum i don't believe we currently have it on display but we have it in our collection but it's it's meant to be obviously symbolic of um, you know the loss of some some of their uh... colleagues and uh... it's I, I, you know, I always appreciate these particular types of moments. We we could not have paid, we could not be witnesses to that, but it's um, wonderful that we were able to sort of participate uh, vicariously uh, thanks to the photograph. And so we have, you know, an evidence of of that sharing and and, and sort of um, sharing of an opportunity with um, their colleagues, the, the the deceased astronauts and cosmonauts. Um, on the surface of the moon, I think it's it's a kind of incredible that that was that was done. Okay. So before some time like that, John F. Kennedy had, had stated that he wanted to reach out to the Soviet Union for a cooperative movement and have them participate in it. Unfortunately, that never took place because of the events that happened. Um, in 1963, so so this thought that we were fellow explorers, that we face the same dangers, that we have these losses, uh, really is a part of humanity. Uh, harken back, you know, to the days of polar exploration, where even though Abinson made it to the South Pole, we all mourned the loss of Scott and his party. Um, we are all in this together, this great and noble adventure. And I think that set the tone for the future where we look to things like the International Space Station and, and other cooperative ventures that, that are going to go on in the future. This picture from Apollo Soyuz Test Project where we joined the Apollo, last Apollo with Soyuz um, was uh, really indicative of where the future lies and that we are going on into the solar system and to the stars together. So following on the footsteps of uh, Paul Soyuz, we had the Shuttle Mir program um, in the mid-90s where a handful of seven U.S. astronauts spent um, three or four months on board the Mir space station, including our Shannon Lucid and the two Yuris, at least one of whom is here today. Uh, and then, of course, Expedition One, um, an international crew, as all the crews have been since its inception, and the magnificent uh, ISS project. So the last um, bit that I'd like to share with you is uh, that this gentleman, uh, LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was president <clears throat> during most of the uh, Apollo program, um, Right before he left office, he sent this picture of, which is commonly called Earthrise, and which you will commonly see rotated 90 degrees from this orientation because it looks more natural, but this is actually what it looked like. I should probably ask Jennifer to explain a little bit. But um, he sent this, a copy of this picture to uh, every head of state that, uh, that was in his Rolodex with a message of how, you know, this, this uh, achievement is something that, in, in the words of Neil Armstrong, was for all mankind, well, at least for the plaque. Do you want to talk about the picture? Yeah. Uh, so I, as his outgoing message, uh, LBJ had, uh, and I don't know if it was suggested by him personally or if this is something that came up through his staff, but... Uh, made a decision that this was um, a, a significant enough and, and sort of meaningful gesture that he wanted to make on behalf of the United States and, on, and, and as a personal message to leaders around the world. And so, with a, with no, with a, a, along with a note to each of those leaders, sent a copy of, of that photograph um, and kept that photograph actually in the Oval Office as well um, during his last days. And you can even see pictures of it in the Oval Office with Richard Nixon in his early days. And um, what was what's unique about this particular story is the response that came back. Um, the one of the most interesting ones, I think, um, was talked about in an interview after the fact that uh, his his most surprising 
response came from Ho Chi Minh, who wrote back a personal note to say thank you, and that really symbolizes, I think, a message that you could get from, um, as w was discussed earlier, about the, um, the world tour that the Apollo 11 astronauts took, that this was a shared experience. This is not something that happened in isolation, that it was seen by, by everyone, and, and especially those in other countries, as something that was a global experience, that this was humankind going to another place. And while I can't translate in French, I'm not that skilled. Um, you know, I know that it was uh, he was it was incredibly honored to have received something like that, and I suspect that was a shared feeling amongst leaders around the world that they were being um, sort of personally brought into that experience by Johnson. I, 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 I'm struck by the number of young folks in the back of the room who may not know the relationship between Lyndon Johnson. I was about to elaborate a little bit. Um, first, I'll translate. It says, I thank you for, the, for sending these photos of the moon that were taken on Apollo 8. And uh, I, we have to excuse Jennifer because she wasn't born yet either, but we were in the midst of a terrible war uh, in Vietnam, and Ho Chi Minh was basically the, um, the head of state of the opposing country. And so in the middle of a war where... Uh, Tens, hundreds of thousands of people died to have this exchange between the two heads of states on opposite sides was quite remarkable, and I think indicative of the um, of the international impact that that the lunar the lunar landings had. So, speaking of which, the last slide is one that was taken by the lunar reconnaissance orbiter of the Apollo 11 landing site, and what I wanted to ask the panelists of with this sort of as a, a framework is this was over 50 years ago. Um, what's next? First of all, I think the accomplishment of this kind of photo and others from the LRO is to perhaps c convince a few more people that it wasn't all a hoax. <laughs> you know, uh, as Charlie Duke has said many times, he said, you know, if we wanted to fake the moon landings, why did we fake it nine times? <laughs> so, going to the moon nine times. So, yeah, the moon is the, the springboard to the future. As I mentioned with the, the, the idea of using the lunar resources, I think that Apollo has opened the way with the samples that they brought back, with the ones that were returned by the Soviet lunar program. We now have some knowledge of our twin companion in space, and now we're getting an idea of the resources that are out there. And so for the first time, I think what's going to happen in this next visit to the moon is we're going to use the natural resources in space in addition to solar energy, which we've done for many years, but we're now going to use the raw materials that are in space to fuel our spacecraft, to provide our astronauts with oxygen, to, to provide cosmonauts with drinking water, to have a lunar village, I hope, on the model suggested by the European Space Agency. And I think that'll be like in Antarctica, a cooperative venture where we'll learn, where we'll, where we'll learn to work together, um, preserve the historical resources on the moon. I think that's something we should all support. But then use the resources that are there that we can tap to help us um, propel ourselves to the search for life on Mars. So in the 21st century, we're still, we're still going to be referring back to the lessons learned back in the 20th century 50 years ago. Jennifer, as a historian, what are your thoughts? Well, certainly the preservation of the existing landing sites is, is crucial. Uh, I know there's always interest in, in treating them as, uh, you know, sort of first destinations to go and kind of photograph or have a rover go really close to the edges. I think it's important for us to think about them as historic locations. They are just that, even though they're on the moon. And so protecting them as we would protect um, any, you know, in a, a sort of national park type sense here in the United States or other kind of historic um, United Nations protected heritage site is something that we, we probably, we really need to consider seriously in preparation for those landings. Um, the fact that those boot prints are undisturbed and that they can be seen from LRO and, and from other vehicles, I think it's important to kind of think about them that way. 
um, and, and maybe create uh, our own sort of Smithsonian subsidiary on the moon where we have our own little muni museum up there. But um, ah, that's my fantasy world, maybe. <laughs> um, I'd be happy to be the first curator, though. Um, I, I, I'm excited to see this. I, as someone who grew up hearing, uh, you know, sort of in the abstract about uh, going to the moon and, and seeing us uh, orbit so so successfully and learn so much and develop so much new technology here on Earth and, and have that directly informed by research going on in space. I think I'm you know, most excited to see how we take the best of what we've learned over the last um, 40 years of human spaceflight in the post-Apollo era and implement that in, in new ways and, and working collaboratively um, the last almost now, it's what we're just coming up on the 19th anniversary of the International Space Station's uh, occupation. I think all the things that we've learned in, in cooperating in that period are going to be crucial to going forward and, and making the moon a permanent home. Wayne, last word. So we are at the very beginning of human exploration of the solar system. Um, when I was a lad, we thought Venus was a swampy planet. We were sure there were canals on Mars. All kinds of things that we have found out are not the way we thought. Now we think there's life on Enceladus, potentially on Triton, the moon Neptune, and and I and I've got to say we have touched the moon six places with human hands, ten pricks really around the equator, a few miles, a few kilometers we've traversed uh, on a planet that the, the uh, or, or the moon that has a surface area greater than the African continent. Uh, when we go back, when we go forward to the moon, we'll go to the poles where we think all this marvelous water can be harvested, turned into drinking water, rocket fuel, and, uh, and everything else that we need to survive in space, potentially for a permanently, um, I was going to say man, that's not how you say it, a permanently crewed um, outpost uh, at, the, at the pole of the moon, and that will enable us to go on to Mars, Phobos de Mars and to the other places in the solar system, this journey has just started. It won't end with us, it won't end with our children, it won't end with our grandchildren, and who knows where our great-grandchildren will be uh, if, we, if we persist and go forward. And I, and I have great hopes that we will see those steps in the next few years move on out into the solar system. Well, with those uh, very eloquent words from the always eloquent Wayne. Let's uh, give these fantastic panelists a round of applause. <laughs> and what I'd like to do for the next, well, however long there's interest, um, is entertain questions or comments from the ASC membership. We have uh, two microphones that will be circulating. We'll have sequential interpretation so you can hear both the question and the answer. And um, just raise your hand and one of the people holding the microphone will guide themselves to you. I guess it's obvious if you're watching the streamed um, video, but the URL to send the questions to um, that we'll get to in a second is on the screen for you to see. I guess uh, I'm up first. I thought someone had a microphone over there. Uh, I'd like to make a comment, and this is for the young people in the back, about how science works, which, Tom, you commented on it about uh, the mars size impact of a planetary body on the Earth creating the moon. And, you know, the, the deductive investigative steps is how do you get that from having a rock in your hand? And, and one of the things that's remarkable, and I'll make another comment about Mars in a similar fashion, is that the basalts found on the moon in those rocks, the, the chemicals structure and nature of the geology found on the moon 
was almost identical to that found on Earth, and that's not something that happens randomly. It's a very unlikely situation. So the deduction, therefore, from the chemistry was that the moon and the Earth were once one or similar, and that's how that... And then they had to figure out, well, how does something get created like the moon from an impact? And that, that was the, the modeling that was done afterwards. Uh, a similar comment about Mars, and you mentioned uh, we have, uh, you know, lunar samples out here. There are samples that nature has brought back from Mars uh, already, and they were free. We didn't have to send a spacecraft to go get them. Uh, there were impacts on Mars that kicked material off of Mars that sent them out into space, and some of the, that material wound up uh, in Antarctica. And it probably wound up in many other places on the Earth, but Antarctica is a place that's not inhabited, has the ice, and, and the nature of the ice on Antarctica pulled those, those samples to the surface. And in those samples was, were little nodules, bubbles of atmosphere from Mars that was identical to what we measure on Mars when we could directly measure from the, from the surface of the Earth. So that's sort of the, the chemistry, the analysis, the, the detective work that science does to say, okay, well, here's, here's the fingerprint inside the bubble, and it looks exactly the same as that found on Mars, so hence the deductive reasoning that there is an equation there. And so that's how uh, a lot of the science gets done. And so you, you gave the thought, Tom, about uh, the impact and, and the rocks coming back, and that gave us that. But there was the investigative trail on how it was done. And, and I hopefully a lot of the students in the back will, will, will become detectives of the future for other samples we get. Thanks, Mario. Does somebody else have a microphone? I can basically blind up here. Oh, Gerhard, go ahead. I have a question to, to the panel. JFK said we want to do these things and, no, we want to go to the moon and do all the other things. Any suggestions on what the other things might be, might have been? So John F. Kennedy was nothing if not an idealist. He he wanted to, uh, he, he was very interested in the technology involved in desalinating seawater because fresh water was a problem even in 1961, 62. And as you know, it's still a problem in many areas around the world. He was, he was uh, very, very interested in the advancement of all mankind. He, he talked about uh, uh, bringing, you know, better living conditions all around the world, started uh, organizations like the Peace Corps. I mean, it, 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 it's hard to say what what you think he might have meant by that, other than by his other writings and speeches. But he was interested in many problems which are difficult and remain difficult. In addition to going to the moon, but if we could go to the moon, we could demonstrate anything was possible. Yes, sir. This question is addressed to Jennifer, but I invite the others to speak up. Would you care to comment when you look at the values of space exploration? Would you care to comment on robotic exploration and human exploration? Well, in the terms that I normally think of those two, um, it's usually in, in the sense of the value of having, I, I look mostly at photographs, and so I think of what, is the, what are the stories that are possible because there is a person behind that camera versus a person on the ground robot, robotically, you know, controlling a robot or controlling a telescope in space. What, what kinds of things make that different? And I think fundamentally it is very different. Um, that's not necessarily implicit when you look at a photograph, though. That's not something you necessarily know by looking at a photograph, that who, who the photographer was, where was that photographer, where was that person. But I think when you combine that narrative, when you've got the layers of narrative that you've got a photograph, you've got a person who took that photograph, and they can tell those stories in conjunction with the photograph, I know that's something that um, 
I had talked to Gene Cernan about years ago when I was working on my dissertation, and, and that was what his goal was when he was you know, learning to take photographs. He wanted to, to have those photographs as the way in which he told his story sort of as a compliment to the, the words and the experience that he had. And I don't think you can really do that necessarily the same way when you're talking about the rovers on Mars. We have scientists who tell those stories, but it's not quite the same thing. It's, there's, a, um, there's, there's just a different narrative structure to all of that in terms of the value of telling those kinds of stories in a setting, in an educational setting, which is where I work. The, the, the opportunities that we have to tell those stories um, are, are slightly different. I always think about the Hubble Space Telescope this way as well. These are incredibly valuable materials, but you have to dig down a couple of layers and, and also explain how Hubble imagery comes about, how it's created and why it looks the way it does. There's more to that story that's not necessarily understood by the public, um, but I think it's very understandable that when you show them a photograph by an astronaut, that there was a person that was seeing that in that moment. Um, one of the ones I like to describe often is the one that Michael Collins took of the lunar module in, in the foreground and the Earth in the background. Sometimes it's called the loneliest man because it's all of human history except for him in that photograph. And so it's a very unique perspective that had never happened before. And that I think those kinds of stories are the ones that really have an, a, a different kind of impact on the viewer. But it takes a lot to get there. Um, it's, it's, but it's, it's of incredible value to be able to merge those two stories, the person and the, and the photograph itself. So I had the very interesting and, and uh, privilege of working with Steve Squires uh, for a number of years. Steve Squires, uh, if you don't know, was the uh, University of, uh, Cornell University uh, planetary scientist who was the principal investigation for the Mars Exploration Rovers. And he talked about, you know, how proud he was of that, that whole effort. You know, they sent two rovers. Um, they were supposed to last 90 days. It lasted 10 years for one and 15 years for the other. And, and they explored, I think, up to 14 miles total duration. I may have those numbers not exactly right, but really incredible. And, uh, and, and at the same time, he said, gosh, I wish I could go. Uh, in place of the rovers because I could do in three days what they did in 14 years. So, you know, having a human on site is very powerful. Robotics and human spaceflight go together. They are not separate. They complement each other. Then the robots will always go ahead of us, and they will go to dangerous places where the radiation is high or what have, have you. But, you know, um, um, in terms of scientific efficiency, Having humans there would, would be the real payoff, I think. When it comes down to looking for life on Mars, which is one of the, the huge questions in front of us as a species, you know, are we alone in the universe? Where are we going to find it? Well, we don't know exactly. It could be Mars, could be Enceladus, could be um, Europa around Jupiter. But we've got to go there to find out. And those really tough questions and the, uh, getting the answers to those really tough questions involves a uh, joint effort between uh, robots to do the reconnaissance, maybe even lay in some of the logistics ahead of time before humans arrive. But for example, on Mars, if there, we know the surface environment of Mars is very hostile to life today, as we know it, and uh, so it's unlikely to be found a, a microbial colony lying around on the surface of Mars. However, there are hot springs on Mars, and we, kn we know this from the mineralogical evidence we see from orbit. Um, if, like on Earth at Yellowstone, we find extremophiles forms of life that can exist in very hot places or very cold places. On Mars, you might find them in a hot springs 100 meters beneath the surface, where there's still groundwater in the aquifer percolating through a heat source from volcanic uh, energy from the planet's interior. No robot that we can conceive can get down 100 meters below the surface of Mars, but a human expedition could accomplish that with the right equipment and the right stay times up there. So if you really want those answers, and it's a natural human characteristic of all of us to want to see the answer or to learn the answer before we depart this planet, it's a natural human tendency to get the, the answers more quickly. If we wait a century, maybe AI will do it for us. I don't want to wait a century. I want to find out whether there's life in the solar system in my lifetime. So that's, that's the push for doing things with robots and humans together. Anybody else have a microphone? Oh, great. Uh, so I think uh, exploration of the universe is something that we can do. We've actually, the, the engineering technology is not, not the long haul in the past. It's the, the will of 
of humanity to do that. So I'm actually curious from a perspective of you know, programmatic and astronautic as well as uh, general public perspective. What are those barriers right now? We've talked about all the wonderful things we can do. <clears throat> Excuse me, we can do by going you know, to the moon and exploring our own solar system. But what do you see as being uh, the, the, um, the, the, the real barriers here? And I'm thinking how things have changed. You know, we, we talk about the early Apollo era where you had the United States basically leading the charge because it was a space race and there were, there were political motivations behind the technological developments and, and actually uh, accomplishing the task. But then it morphed into a program that became collaborative uh, across our country, or across our globe. And many countries participated in this experiment called the International Space Station, which is, you know, a, a testament to what human beings can do when we all work together. But as we see the current uh, political trends across our globe, it seems that, that countries are tending to be more, uh, look internally for their... Um, motivation and, and uh, economic drivers and um, and so I just I'm curious from your perspectives how, how does that fit into the barriers because in my opinion it's not it's not technological it's a, that's a question that that I think we all need to grapple with I'm I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Jim Bridenstine the NASA administrator he's been making a series of speeches around the country lately where he talks about, you know, he's got this great team in, in, in NASA and his organization that he feels can solve any technical problem and, and therefore the technical risk can be um, taken care of. Uh, but what he's got to do is uh, work to drive down the political risk. Um, really, I, I agree with your assessment. It's not the technology that's holding us up. It's the will. And, and every time that there's a poll of the American public, do you support the space program or are you pleased with the American space program, and it always comes back very positive. But then if they ask the question, do you think we're spending, uh, do you think we should spend more on the American space program, the answer comes back no. So it's what, how much money do you want to spend? Perhaps if there was commerce in space and we weren't relying on tax dollars, then there would be a business that would be interested in advancing the technology, and I'll just leave it at that. I would just uh, say, add briefly to that that um, you know one of the things that we do in the museum is you know engage in this topic with young people. I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of developing uh, enthusiasm and collaboration by youth today on a number of different large scale issues. I think you're starting to see that come together, especially in the United States, um, in terms of gun violence and lots of other topics. It's that that um, youth movement that could provide some of that motivation. If that motivation is felt deeply enough and strongly enough, um, in terms of I don't know if it's an imperative um, that you know we need to find another place or we need to find off Earth resources. If that's the kind of motivation it would take. I think the you know the overwhelming majority of young people are the ones that would have to carry that out, and we need to prepare them for that possibility and encourage them to engage in STEM fields and things like that. And so um, I, it, we're kind of on the right path. It's just is there going to be that sort of crucial moment when something turns to change the direction or to um, you know really provide that um, that paradigm shift? And I just don't know that we're there yet. I agree with Wayne that it's probably a commercial boost that's going to add enough to get us over the hump or provide the, the center of the, the critical mass that requ that's required to go forward with, with more ambitious human endeavors in space. So uh, one, can, one can imagine the market being developed for water produced in space, so from the lunar poles, from some of the nearby asteroids perhaps, uh, and that being a commercially developed market where NASA and the other space agencies are customers for exploration efforts as well as commercial activity in space. So water as a raw material, dirt as a, as a raw material, metals, iron, nickel, uh, titanium. These materials are found in space on the moon, on the nearby asteroids, and they can be the feedstocks for um, the commercial mining adventures or ventures out there. Um, I don't know who's going to how long it's going to take to realize a profit from that, but I think that's the key, is to make money in space from the resources that are out there, 
share those benefits broadly, uh, have it to be have it a, a multinational endeavor. And then I think that um, the other key component is to widen the experience space and space of human beings. You know, so we're very lucky that all of us space flyers have been able to experience the space environment and the perspectives gained therefrom. When we have tourism taking place and we have more and more human beings being able to come back and tell us about their experiences in space so that many more people on this planet know someone who's been to space. Uh, then the appeal of going into space, the appeal of more human activity there, the appeal of um, sending humans into space, even at great cost and risk, I think will be more, um, more imaginable and more, um, more, support, more supported by the population. So I'm looking forward to that, um, that aspect of it is seeing this human space experience broadened. I'm uh, secretly pleased to be thinking along the same lines as uh, it's Danny over there that had that question. Um, when I saw the film this morning about Artemis, I really, I, I love, you know, I, you know me, I love inspiration. But when there was a part in there that says, you know, we, we go for the United States, you know, part of me squirmed because, you know, we're here we are, this international organization, and and I'd be interested in what the panel thinks that ASC or the individuals within ASC could do to, you know, whether change that balance in the ways that it can be or needs to be changed. I mean, without, you know, some big national will, a lot of these projects can't succeed. And yet, I think in the history of the space program, it's always been individual people that build these bridges. And when, you know, when I read something like, we come in peace for all mankind, I think a lot about what the meaning of the word we is and how we in this room are, some of the only ones that could have that, that conversation. And so I challenge you at dinner tonight, all of you, to talk about what we can do. And I'd like to hear from the panel what they think. Well, I'll start off by saying, you know, as an outsider to all of this, um, I would encourage all of you to find, and it sounds like this is sort of a part of what you do, is reach out into the community, um, going out to schools, going out to um, technical programs at universities, reaching out to museums. One of the things that we do at the National Air and Space Museum when we encounter, and particularly this is a story of the past and working with some of the Apollo astronauts, is if you have something that can carry your story in a place where people can see it, that they can share in understanding what that means, if it's a personal item, if it's something. Being able for a young person to go to a place, and I was recently um, in Ashland, Nebraska, at the uh, at Strategic Air Command Museum, and saw a wonderful display there, and I, and I saw kids coming up to it and, I, and just admiring the fact that this was, this was a real person. This was something, I, I, that's, that material, that, that encounter with that thing is life-changing for some people. Um, and so meeting astronauts, meeting cosmonauts, but also making that a, an international effort where you, you know, share in those kinds of experiences with people in other countries is, I, I just, I'm, I'm, you know, proud that I can be in a uh, place where we bring and provide those opportunities all the time. And I think that's, you know, certainly something that's invaluable to those who uh, won't or might not make it there. Well, you know, I, I, I see some of those statements made from time to time, and I kind of cringe because, uh, of course, we're not going to, to the moon on Artemis just as Americans. The European Space Agency is building the service module for the Orion spacecraft, uh, and it wouldn't go anywhere without the service module, and, and on and on. I, after, after, uh, uh, after the loss of the Columbia Space Shuttle, there was a policy debate at the highest levels of the American government about what ought to happen to the space program, and, and uh, there were those that said we should terminate, we should, you know, end the International Space Station and uh, just not do it anymore, but because the United States had three obligations and partners in space, that we in this country were obligated to continue the space program, and in fact, the Russians came to the rescue with Soyuz and have provided transportation um, and, and so forth. So, um, it, as we as we go forward, we are already tied together, and the thought that is just an American adventure is 
is uh, it, it's not it just can't happen that way. So, so many of us have been involved in, in the International Space Station and its creation and its operation, and it's still going to surprise us with the, the, the results coming from that station in the next 10 years or so. It's billed as the largest, most complex international technical project in history. It's not going to be the last. Are there any more? Yeah. John. Uh, I think we're all big fans of uh, human exploration, and I certainly am. Uh, we now have the third administration who has proposed a restarting of human exploration. And the first two didn't fund it. I fear that we're not funding it now either, certainly not funding it adequately. Now, there was a number about 25 years after Apollo 11, and it may have been a part of an urban myth of the time, I don't know. But the saying was that the economy was grown as a result of the increases in technology to such an extent that $17 in tax money was returned to the federal budget for every dollar spent on Apollo. I wonder if our panel has any insight as to whether those numbers are real or whether today, some 50 years later, the equation is even more in the favor of adequate funding for exploration. No, John, I don't have answers that are concrete, and I don't think anybody does. So that would be something that, I, well, I think NASA has wished for those numbers for many years, but it would be a great, great academic uh, endeavor to find out what the economic benefit or multiplier was from every dollar or, or ruble or, or euro invested in human space exploration. So, but I, I do believe it's positive, certainly. So if you want to know what you can do right now, I would say write your congressman because uh, for those of you that are United States citizens or, or your own politician back home, um, and tell them that the budget is being discussed right now. Right now. Um, Congress is in session tomorrow. And one of the first things on the Senate CJS committee is the NASA budget. And will they increase the uh, a budget by $1.6 billion, which is the administration or the agency really request to put Artemis on track. So, so you, you want to make a difference. You know, it, it, a lot of people in this audience have powerful voices and raise them and support because now is a critical time. And I guarantee you if the money doesn't come forward for whatever reason, um, uh, the whole Artemis uh, thing will, will go the way of previous administrations. Um, no bucks, no Buck Rogers, right? Yeah, I know. There is a famous uh, graph that uh, shows that plus the number of PhD earned as a function of time, uh, fully correlated with the NASA budget, which demonstrates how the Apollo program. Uh, you know, inspired teenagers in mass to choose STEM disciplines and motivated them to go to PhD. Do you think the Artemis and the Gateway will inspire the same way the current generation, or there are so many other things going on in, in life that they might be not as much interested as in the past? Well, I think that's a great example that I'd forgotten about, so thank you, Jean-Francois, for bringing it up. And I think that there's no question that when young people today are growing up in the 21st century and they're wondering what to do with their lives, you know, the excitement of space exploration, the potential to be an innovator, the potential to be an entrepreneur in space, uh, we've got some really bright minds already creating the commercial space sector and helping NASA as it tries to move forward. I think that to be a part of that, I think, is a, ver a big option for young people that wasn't available in 1969. You know, you could earn a PhD and do research, perhaps on the Apollo samples, but you couldn't be a space entrepreneur in 1969. That's an entire new universe of opportunity 
for young people today that I think that um, is about to open up. When you think of unknown territory being opened up, thrown wide open to human innovation and curiosity for the first time, like on the moon, like on the nearby asteroids, like eventually the, the, the knowledge mines on Mars, I think that's where people would like to get their, uh, see their future lie. There's a <clears throat> computer interactive that's actually outside that we, uh, out in the, uh, the uh, space shuttle outside here that we developed at our museum. It's called Space for You. And it asks students, young people, to answer a series of very fun questions about what they might be interested in. And it gives them a series of careers as options. And after all of the presentations we've had at our museum from astronauts, the one thing that comes up, and it comes up in this, and it's kind of demonstrated in this interactive, this uh, computer interactive, is that you have to have a passion for what you're doing. And there are so many ways you can play a role in space flight. And I don't think that that's really appreciated by young people, is that you don't have to, there's not just one career in space flight. There are so many ways to be involved, and if you really care about it, you'll find a way. And so those are the kinds of instances where I know museums and other education centers are really trying to get people to think outside the box and think of all those new ways in which they can be involved. You can be a historian and be involved in spaceflight in some way, and that's not something I think a lot of young people would really think about. And so there are those opportunities, those unseen opportunities that um, we also want to uh, you know, enlighten young people about and maybe they'll pursue a PhD in, in biological sciences or all kinds of other things that they never really felt connected to the space program before, but we can enlighten them about that. I uh, was inspired uh, as a youngster by reading an essay by Arthur C. Clarke, the famous science and science fiction writer, who said the choice before us is the universe or nothing. You either grow and continue to learn and expand your knowledge and do new things, or you fall down into a slow, steady decline. And I think that's really the choice we're looking at, the universe or nothing as a planet. You know, and we talk about people worried about climate change and what's going to happen to the planet. And I would tell you, you know, 50 years ago when I was a young person, is it 50 years that long ago? Um, we were worried about thermonuclear war. It's, it's like, are we going to go forward or are we going to self-destruct? We've got to continue to press on. Okay. Very thought-provoking question. I'd like to thank our host, Space Center Houston, and the folks on the audiovisual uh, team that helped put this together. I'd like to thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention and some of you for your very thoughtful questions. And, of course, Thank Tom, Jennifer, and Wayne for their participation as brilliant panelists. Thank you. I think the plan now is we've got a half an hour break uh, until the next session, so please be back in your seats at 3.30 sharp. Thank you.
Ready? Okay. This is hot. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our last uh, technical panel for the Association of Space Explorers for this afternoon. Uh, this is a bit of an unusual panel for us, but was requested by not just the, uh, the flyers, the delegates of ASC, but also the companions, because it addresses some of the challenges of health for future exploration, what we found, uh, what might be applicable to us now as a, as a more of an aging, retired population in ASC. And we're going to hear different perspectives on that. So I'm going to read, uh, go down first on who's on the panel and then introduce each one of them. Many of these will be, these individuals will be recognizable to you, uh, first of all. So John Charles, Dr. John Charles, is now the scientist in residence at Space Center Houston. Many of you might have known him as the chief scientist at Johnson Space Center on exploration uh, and, and medical topics related to uh, space exploration. Next to him, Dr. Richard Jennings. Uh, Richard used to be chief of flight medicine. He was uh, my flight surgeon uh, for part of the time when I was training in Russia. He's a great flight surgeon. He retired. He's uh, taught at UTMB. Uh, and he also is a consultant now in commercial space flight. So he can talk about what some of the standards are for the commercial flyers as well. Next to him, Dr. Oleg Kotov, a retired cosmonaut and also a physician, an MD. Uh, he is now the deputy director of the Russian Institute for Biomedical Problems, IBMP, in Russia. To his right, Dr. Ch uh, Chiaki Mukai, also a medical doctor that flew on Space Lab on the Space Shuttle. And she's still active as well. She is now vice president of the Tokyo, Insti uh, Tokyo University of Science in Japan. To her right, another astronaut physician, uh, Dr. Andre Kuipers, retired astronaut from the Netherlands, and he's going to give us an ESA perspective on uh, health and different perspectives of flying in space. To his right, Dr. Sue Bloomfield is a professor, PhD, from Texas A&M University, and I do collaborative research uh, with Dr. Bloomfield in trying to understand uh, some of the, how we might collect uh, international retired data. We discussed this at the last Congress, but we're actually uh, conducting a feasibility study, a funded feasibility study. So on Friday, I'll be passing out some questionnaires to the delegates, and I hope you'll fill them out. They'll really help us understand what we need to know in order to implement what we'd like to do, which is in the future, to pool all of this international data. And then we decided we'd look at one potential solution to an area that's been discussed considerably uh, over the last uh, decades, and that is how do we protect against uh, radiation environments in space, those outside of low Earth orbit, uh, composed of solar particle events as well as galactic cosmic rays. And so uh, Kat Kodera of Lockheed Martin has been working on something called the STEMRAD, there's a model behind me. She'll talk about it that I believe is already in space, right? No. Launching, I'm sorry, almost in space. So some of the technology solutions along uh, that line. So, uh, and we hope that there are Q&A at the end of this because you have a, a really unique group of uh, individuals here who can answer those questions. So I'd like to start out with um, Dr. John Charles. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Is it real? I don't think it's I'm going to turn it on, yes. That's the trick, is after you start talking, it comes on. Uh, thank you very much, Bonnie, for the opportunity to be here to talk to you about uh, the, the, the work that we all collectively have been involved in and that is ongoing. This uh, presentation, my presentation will be old hat to the flyers, but to the companions and to our guests, this might be some new information. So I want to talk to you about the human hazards and risks from space exploration, hopefully, hopefully not surprising the flyers with things that they didn't know were hazards and risks of space flight. I want to tell you a little bit about the crew hazards in deep space missions. Uh, not all of these are present in low Earth orbit missions like the International Space Station, but uh, these are the kinds of problems and risks and hazards that may appear on deep space missions. First off is the one that Bonnie just alluded to, the radiation environment of deep space. 
The radiation environment of deep space, of course, is, is, involved, is uh, composed of, of galactic cosmic radiation, that is the radiation that's generated in, the, in supernovas throughout the galaxy, uh, which perversely might be considered to be all be aimed at the astronauts' bodies in deep space. And those are the uh, relativistically moving uh, ionized nuclei of, of atoms up to the atomic weight of iron. There's also solar particle events generated at the sun, solar ma uh, coronal mass ejections, uh, electrons and uh, photons uh, from the sun that, that result from solar flares. Uh, those are filtered by Earth's magnetic field, and that is the, that's what forms the Van Allen belts that surround the Earth. There's very little shielding against galactic cosmic radiation except for something like a planet. So it's, uh, the, the galactic cosmic radiation is, is something that's probably inevitable uh, in terms of exposure in deep space. Solar particle events can be shielded against, and you'll hear more about that from Kat Cordera at the end of the, of the panel. And the risks that, the, that, the, uh, that NASA is looking at are summarized as a single risk, that is the risk of space radiation exposure on human health. I should tell you that this list of hazards and the list of risks I'm going to go through are those that are developed and maintained by NASA's human research program uh, that uh, has the, uh, the charter of making it medically possible for astronauts, for NASA astronauts, to go on trips to Mars. So these are the risks that the human research program is analyzing, is, is uh, funding research to, to minimize. They have been organized into groups of hazards just for for bookkeeping and because of similarity, uh, but the, uh, uh, you, can, you can quibble about some of the, the, uh, the organization into hazards if you want, but that doesn't change the, the basic story. Radiation has effects on uh, the human body. In the long term, it may increase the risk of cancer, and uh, the, the risk of uh, lifetime risk of cancer is the defining space radiation risk in the human research program. Uh, but there are other aspects of radiation uh, of a more immediate term, that is uh, soft tissue damage, and even during a mission, the effects of, of uh, radiation on cognition, on the, the, the ability of the astronauts' brains to function during space missions. And then there's other, other problems like uh, uh, lung cancer and, and uh, uh, cataract formation as uh, soft tissue damage and disruption of stem cells and, and so forth. So everybody, I think everybody is united in thinking that radiation is a bad thing and they try to minimize the exposure to it. One of the questions that has been uh, raised uh, in terms of the Apollo missions is why weren't the astronauts killed by the radiation of space? And the answer is if you do it cleverly, you can go through the thinnest parts of the Van Allen belts where the radiation is thickest, and you go through it quickly at the beginning of the mission, at the end of the mission when your velocity is high. Loitering in the Van Allen belts is a bad idea, but going through them quickly does not significantly increase your radiation exposure and the risk to the astronauts. And as Kat will tell you in a few minutes, there are ways to protect against radiation exposure. Uh, you can go faster, you can, you can uh, avoid radiation in, uh, concentrations, you can uh, do other things like shielding, and there's different ways to shield, uh, but one of the ways to shield is by the garment that is uh, on display over my shoulder right now. After the risk of, uh, after the hazard of radiation, there's the hazard of altered gravity fields. I will tell you personally, I think this is not so much a hazard as an inducement or an enticement. I'm fascinated by weightlessness and the, uh, the, the possibility of altered gravity fields on other planets, and those altered gravity fields do not manifest themselves as uh, by uh, Fred uh, Astaire's dancing, and I think it was, it was a 1942 movie uh, that done with the trick of the camera, but it is manifested by such incidents as John Young jumping a, a meter or so into the sky, not into the air on the moon, but into the sky of the moon uh, due to the low gravity of the moon. That low gravity uh, on the moon is one-sixth of Earth's gravity. And as a reminder, uh, Mars has about one-third of Earth's gravity, so the moon's gravity is about one-half of Mars's, which is why it's an interesting idea to, to do data collection on the moon to inform our preparations for going to Mars. We do not know in any practical sense the beneficial or detrimental effects of gravity between zero G, that is the weightlessness of ballistic spaceflight, orbital spaceflight, and Earth normal gravity. We all in this room are experiencing 1G, normal Earth gravity. 
and in orbit. Uh, those six of our colleagues who are in orbit right now are experiencing zero gravity or weightlessness. Uh, but in between there, we do not know whether one-sixth of a G, one-sixth gravity as found on the moon, is one-sixth as harmful uh, or, or five-sixths as harmful uh, as weightlessness or one-sixth as beneficial as Earth gravity. We do not know whether the Mars gravity is one-third as beneficial or two-thirds as harmful as weightlessness. We just don't have that information. And we're probably not going to get that information in any significant volume until we put people on the moon for a long period of time and then uh, until they allow people like me to make measurements on them so we can deduce the effects of that weightlessness. So a, a word to you flyers, please tell your, your uh, successors that it's okay to answer the phone when we call and ask for data collection on the moon. Interestingly enough, uh, if we understand the effects of, of Earth gravity and lunar gravity and Mars gravity on biology and physiology, we'll have pretty much covered the solar system because almost all of the solid surfaces in the solar system are on planets that have either Earth gravity or almost Earth gravity, Mars gravity or thereabouts, and moon gravity or thereabouts. So it's really a small investment up front that can open up the solar system to us biologically. And there are the risks that are part of the hazard of altered gravity fields. Uh, these are the, gra the, the risks that the human research program is working its way through. And they include the, the bone loss, the muscle loss, the cardiovascular changes. Uh, the most recent risk that's been identified is the one that affects the, the ocular manifestations of astronauts in spaceflight. That seems to be associated with, with uh, changes in gravity and so forth. So be assured that all of these risks are receiving funded attention from the human research program in, in an effort to reduce them uh, to the benefit of astronauts going to Mars. After this is uh, what we might call the hostile and closed environment, the hostile environment of outer space with its high vacuum and its uh, radiation and so forth. And uh, the closed environment of the spacecraft, which is the safe place you want to be in the midst of the hostile environment outside. So the, the closed environment of the spacecraft is, is something we, we imagine uh, being comforting, let's say, on the surface of Mars when you might have not only the, the living space, but also perhaps a vivarium or a greenhouse where you can grow uh, leafy vegetables to supplement your, your freeze-dried diet with salads occasionally. Uh, and the, the risks of the hostile and closed environment are just what you might expect. What happens inside of a closed environment? Well, increased carbon dioxide. Uh, decreased oxygen uh, risks of uh, accumulation of toxins from off-gassing and other things, and also the risks from uh, maneuvering that, that uh, closed environment, dynamic loads. That is, what if your spaceship, which is your closed environment, bumps into another spaceship and induces uh, damage, structural damage and so forth, and the effects of, of uh, such things as uh, celestial dust, that is, planetary dust, the dust of the moon, the dust of Mars, when introduced into the habitat uh, in small amounts, hopefully, but it may still have effects on, on normal biological functioning. So these are the kinds of, of risks that the Human Research Program is addressing in this, in this uh, hazard area. Next is isolation and confinement. Uh, the astronauts that, that go to Mars will be isolated as no one has ever been isolated before, the four-person crew on on the, under NASA's planning or the 100-person crew, according to Elon Musk. Either way, we'll be isolated from the rest of humanity in a way that nobody's ever been isolated before. They will be confined in that hopefully uh, benign and, and supportive environment I just described. We would like to minimize the, the, uh, the incidence of cases like this where Mark, Mark Watney is sitting on Mars alone by himself and pining for the green fields of Earth. And we also want to avoid uh, anybody having a bad day. I can, I, astronauts don't take pictures of each other having bad days in space. So I use a picture from a classic old movie, Maroon, showing Gene Hackman as an astronaut yelling at mission control because of uh, bad things that have happened in his flight. But the goal of the isolation and confinement research that's being done at NASA is to understand the incidence and the severity of problems that may occur uh, to the astronauts both uh, within themselves and between the, the members of the team, and then to develop ways to minimize and reverse those bad things that happen so that the team can continue functioning efficiently and effectively on what will be the most challenging set of missions and the, let's be honest, the most expensive human undertaken, undertakings ever undertaken by humans. 
uh, to, to increase productivity and ensure subsequent missions are also able uh, to be successful. And the final one I want to talk to you about is distance from Earth. The, this is sort of a catch-all, and it relates to the inability to resupply astronauts if your medicines go bad or if you run out of medicines or if your food goes bad or if you run out of food and, and also the communications lag times and so forth. Distance from Earth on a, on a trip to Mars is summarized in this chart. Mars at its closest is uh, about as third as far from Earth as the sun is from the Earth or the Earth is from the sun. And at its furthest, it's about twice that far. So Mars, uh, Mars, is, uh, Mars is certainly not nearby. Mars at its closest is about 100 times as far as the moon and at its furthest, roughly 1,000 times as far as the moon is from the Earth. So the distances involved in lunar missions uh, upcoming in the next several years, we hope, uh, are as nothing compared to the distances involved in trips to Mars. Uh, the, the risks included in this hazard are those that relate to uh, adverse health outcomes and decrements in performance due to in-flight medical conditions. That means uh, things that go wrong with the extremely healthy astronauts in these long missions, and don't forget these Mars missions will be on the order of two to three years in duration with, with no chance for visiting the, the ER or the hospital in between there. Uh, and also ineffective or toxic medications on, uh, due to long-term storage. And in, in terms of, of storage for medications, don't forget that the, the medications might be among the supplies that are pre-positioned on Mars before the astronauts arrive, which means they'll have been there for at least two years or so before the astronauts get there, exposed to the hostile environment of Mars surface uh, and uh, possibly uh, developing toxic characteristics or losing their, their efficacy. The, uh, it, one of the ways to think about the distance from Earth is to look at, the fa at the, this picture, which was taken on the surface of Mars by a rover uh, in 2014, showing Earth in the night sky. This was a, a, an evening photograph, and that is, that is the entirety of human experience, that little tiny pinprick in the sky. That dot shows Earth. So this gives just a hint of the kind of isolation and potentially separation that Mars crew members will have. One of the interesting uh, aspects of these hazards, though, is that they are all really uh, manifestations of time. The, the detrimental effects of radiation is due to the time you send, spend exposed to it. I mentioned going through the radiation belts quickly as opposed to loitering. The altered gravity fields, the more time you spend in low gravity, the more likely you are to, to suffer bone and muscle changes. Uh, the, ho the hostile enclosed environment, you'd like to spend as little time in the hostile environment of the vacuum of space as possible, preferably less than 15 or 30 seconds at the most. And the closed environment, of course, may become less uh, benign the longer you're in it and, and uh, the, the, as, uh, as uh, off-gassing and other possibly toxic factors take place. Isolation and confinement is uh, readily understood in terms of time. And distance from the Earth is all about time. Uh, the, the fact that uh, radio waves may take anywhere from 8 minutes to 22 minutes on a one-way trip from Earth to Mars, depending on where Earth and Mars are in their respective orbits, is just one manifestation of the effects of time on uh, the astronauts in spaceflight. So those are the hazards uh, encapsulating the risks of spaceflight. You may think of them as, as uh, buzz kills or as uh, uh, showstoppers. Uh, people like me think of them as... Uh, as uh, career opportunities for additional research to, to understand what can be done in spaceflight. I don't believe, uh, speaking just for myself, that any of them are insurmountable. Some of them will take uh, deliberate attention between now and the time we, we send astronauts to Mars. But there's nothing on those lists that really uh, preclude astronauts going to Mars with the proper support uh, and preparation from those of us back on Earth. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I think it's going to go to Richard next. Thank you, Dr. Charles. I should, mention, I should mention that uh, I was uh, a subject on lower body negative pressure device on two flights, and uh, Dr. Charles was one of my very first scientists, research scientists, uh, working with us, so thank you. Oh, I, okay. And my favorite. <laughs> uh, I'd like to, Dr. Jennings? Thank you. Uh, he just took half my talk, so it'll be a lot shorter than we anticipated. But... Uh, I thank Bonnie for inviting me to speak. It's given me an opportunity to see many dear old friends from the space program. It's, been, it's a great opportunity for me. I do feel like I showed up at a gunfight with a knife, though, without having PowerPoint slides to talk to. 
When I uh, was young and the Mercury program got started in 61, there was a huge conundrum going on, arguments between the National Academy of Science and the operational people, should we launch humans? And they uh, had 40 different things that might happen to the crew members. Some of them are awful. Most of those didn't happen. A few are happening, but even gradually, as you have longer flights and more sensitive testing, some of them are happening. But in 67, when I was a freshman in college, I wrote a, a article called Humans are Go for Space. And during that uh, six-year period, uh, the Gemini program had pretty much showed that uh, people could do fairly good, and they did all the things that you had to do to go to the moon, and a lot of that went away. And that, that does explain my bias. I've always felt like humans can go do these things, and not that there aren't issues. And if you look at the success of Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, uh, ISS, the Russian program, Humans have pretty much done everything, sometimes maybe in spite of the science and the doctors, but uh, sometimes our countermeasures have been helpful and, and we've done some good. Uh, but one of the things that's happened recently in the last three, four years or so is after all these years, 58 years after Gagarin's flight, we've come up with some new problems. And again, part of it's due to mission duration, part of it's due to, you know, back when uh, Alan Shepard launched, we didn't have s ultrasound or CT scans or... Uh, MRIs, and we weren't flying six months, so it's logical that some things could happen, but this space flight associated neuroocular syndrome is really a, a big deal, and when you look at kind of the rest of your life things, some of these changes may be enduring. We're just beginning to find out, but it's not a, not a minor deal. Another one is we've recently found that there's some pretty much stasis of some of the blood vessels in the upper body that can form clots and have formed clots in crew members. And this is something that's totally new. We never knew about this before. And then, you know, divers that do a lot of diving can get white matter lesions in their brain, and we are seeing maybe that there's an increased risk for the white matter lesions in the brain. What they mean, I don't know, it may mean you're going to be an MD after you were, you know, an astronaut. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we don't know what they mean, but they're, uh, uh, they're new and it is a problem. Uh, when you go beyond low Earth orbit. He's already told you all the things, but there's a lot of issues that we're looking at. He listed a lot of them. I have to think a little bit like uh, uh, Calvin Coolidge, you said, if you see ten troubles coming down the road, you can bet that nine of them will run off into the ditch before they get there. But the trouble for the integrated research plan and the trouble for HRP is you don't know which of those is going to make it. And so it doesn't change the science program. And the HRP has this golden opportunity right now with probably the world's best analog for going to Mars and spaceflight, which is the ISS. And it has a limited duration up there, but they can change the day. They can put in those delays. They can, you know, put in the uh, two weeks when you can't have any communication at all. They can do all kind of things on the ISS and also with the lunar program coming up and do a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, testing. The thing I'm going to talk about the most today, and I think it's the area that we do the worst, and it's the... Uh, least studied is the later risk in your life. Astronauts are exposed to a lot of things. He's mentioned some, but CO2 hasn't been mentioned, and we're running high CO2s. We have people breathing nitrox for eight hours over and over in the uh, NBL. We have people on the, that are going to be doing multiple EVAs and depressurizations. We've had nitrogen tetroxide exposures uh, on Apollo Soyuz test project. We've had uh, 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 fiberglass exposure, considerable fiberglass exposure on uh, the uh, Apollo 10. Uh, we've had 18 crew members exposed to uh, celestial dust. And uh, what about the rest of your life, all this microgravity? And I think that the TREAT program that's recently been enacted by Congress is, is a start that isn't going to give us the answers and the protection that we want for crews. Uh, because one of the things is it's an occupational program. And so you're supposed to let people know what that occupational risk is, and then they'll cover that. The trouble is we don't know what we don't know. Five years ago, we wouldn't have known anything about white matter lesions in the brain, or we wouldn't have known anything about uh, a neuroocular syndrome with increased intracranial, increased intracranial pressure that seems to endure in certain crew members. So... I, don't, I think we've got to improve our, our screen, our follow-up. And, and give you an example, it's in my area, because I did you know, gynecology at NASA a long time after Ox, is that right now, particularly young women, are limited in their careers because of radiation standards. 
And truthfully, the radiation to Mars probably isn't going to cause, unless it's a solar particle event, probably isn't going to ruin a mission. But uh, it may have an effect over the rest of your life. And so for women, because they're at more risk for uh, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, and have about a three times higher risk of thyroid cancer, and then have the advantage of living five to seven years where uh, cancers you know, occur after a long, long uh, latency time, they can't get as much radiation. It affects their careers. So how do we follow that in flight medicine when the astronauts come in for their annual exam? We do nothing. We don't, it's so, so important that we would ground them from flying, but it's not important enough right now that we do mammograms or MRIs of the breast or do the best tests that are available to following ovarian cancer. We've got to do much better, much better in that area. And I really think right now that we need, again, to give informed consent for Mars mission. What are you really getting into? We've got 400 people that are still living that have flown, and, and, and these are round numbers, and that essentially one fit physician could coordinate all of that. If you look at a concierge-type medical system, most people have about 400 to 600 people that they take care of. Do they do their cardiac bypass? No but they stay involved in the cardiac bypass. They get the person to the right physician for that. And NASA can't take care of someone in Seattle for everything, but at least they can let the doctors in Seattle know how to report. We can pay for it, and we can get the records back from, from that kind of uh, uh, program. It, it won't cost much. Uh, right now, the program is, what, $20 billion program. It's in that range. We're sending them to a $100 billion space station. For 400, right now, the VA system has uh, 18 million people that are qualified for care in the VA system. Nine million come in each year. We're talking 400. Many of those have TRICARE. Many of those have uh, uh, Medicare. The actual cost of doing these things is minimal. And to me, it's tragic when someone comes in to flight medicine and we say, you don't really ought to get colonoscopy and it's inconvenient back home and they don't get it, then they die from colon cancer. We do not know what the incidence of these cancers are, and I think it's our obligation to follow people to the end of their life. One other thing that I'll mention, and it's a little bit, uh, it probably isn't that controversial, but we've had, for example, recently we've had uh, two astronauts who died. Both spent the most time of anybody on the moon because they were on Apollo 16 and Apollo 17. They were in that dust there on the moon surface for around three days each and then in the capsule coming back. Uh, they both were exposed to fiberglass on STS-10. If you look at the integrated research plan that was updated in July, they show respiratory problems from celestial dust as a serious possibility. Well, you'd think the same program that carries it at a serious possibility would have liked to have had just a little piece of the lung of those two people that were exposed to all that lunar dust and, and uh, that fiberglass. It's, uh, it costs nothing. It costs nothing. I do think that there needs to be a program for autopsies. I don't think it has to be everybody, but, you know, for the, let's look, look at it realistically. Most of us get cremated or put in the ground, and nothing's going to happen good from then on. And... Uh, to know what the incidence of the true incidence of cancer, we know what maybe if we followed people really well, we know the true incidence of clinically appearing cancer. But cancer many times takes years and years before it becomes clinical. By doing autopsies, we probably would have picked up space flight associated neuroocular syndrome, possibly in an autopsy, say, of a Skylab person. Uh, we don't know that, but that's possible. So we don't know what we're looking for. You can't tell them to go look for X on an autopsy because we don't know what we're looking for. But there's a real place for autopsies to provide optimum care for our crews. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I'd like to just make a comment. Uh, many members of this panel were uh, at Rice University uh, over the weekend, actually starting last Friday, at the annual meeting of the Institute of uh, Biomedical uh, ISMS Inst uh, International Space Medicine Summit, which has been going on for several years. And we talk about these topics and try to come up with collective recommendations. And this has been an important part of those discussions. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Kota? Uh, hello, everyone. And sir, let me continue in Russian, just because maybe it's sometimes very useful to listen to Russian language and this auditorium. 
And uh, uh, but before I just want, uh, would like to say uh, it's a very clever decision to put Dr. Charles in the first on this line because after uh, his perfect speech, uh, it, almost everyone has nothing to add to this. <laughs> 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 uh, but I'll say, говорить о проблемах медицинских проблемах дальних космических полетов. Прежде всего хочу сказать, что это одна из самых важнейших задач которая стоит перед э, космонавтикой. about the medical problems of deep space exploration, I can say that this is one of the most important tasks that is before us. Исследования, которые проводятся для того, чтобы сделать доступные полеты в дальний космос проводятся и в России, в частности, в Институте медико-биологических проблем. The research that is being done to make deep space exploration possible is being done all over the world, including Russia at IBMP. Но сразу хочу сказать, что ни одна страна не в состоянии решить все проблемы, которые стоят перед космической медициной. But I can say right now that none of the countries are able to address all of the issues that stand before space medicine. Почему я да, согласен с доктором Чарльзом? Потому что та, те риски и те а, опасности, которые он перечислил, это в том числе результат совместной работы ученых в международных рабочих группах. And I agree with Dr. Charles because the risks and the hazards that he listed, they're being studied in joint groups and in international groups. В рамках тех рисков и тех опасностей, которые учеными были признаны важными для дальних космических полетов, и организуется работа ученых университетов, международных университетов, исследовательских институтов. And the risks and the hazards that have been acknowledged as important for deep space exploration are being studied in research facilities and in universities around the world. В частности, есть небольшое отличие в российском подходе к тем рискам, которые существуют, а именно в том, что идет как бы, разделение на фазы. Доктор Чайс, в частности, вот рассказывал, что все риски идут применительно через Луну к Марсу, то есть такое сквозное. Скажем, в российской космонавтике больше скажем, этап, скажем, этапность решения проблем. And the Russian approach is a little bit different because when we're studying these risks, uh, there's a phase approach. So Dr. Charles mentioned that we're looking at the moon as a gateway, so to speak, to Mars. But in Russia, we break down the phases even deeper. Например, хотелось бы обратить внимание на то, что работая по этим рискам несколько лет назад, решили сделать такую оценку результатов, полученных во время экспериментов на Международной космической станции, применительно как раз к вопросам дальних полетов. For example, I'd like to mention a few studies of the risks that we've done several years ago based on the results of studies at the ISS. В качестве первого этапа как раз определили полеты в окрестности Луны и на поверхность Луны. And so the first stage that we defined was the stage of flying to the moon and around the moon. И получилась некая матрица, где с одной стороны по одной координате это готовность или готовность этой технологии, то есть уровень ее развития, а по другой координате это важность приоритета этой технологии для осуществления конечной задачи. And so we developed a sort of a matrix where on the x-axis you had the readiness, the technical readiness, and on the y-axis you had the importance of the technical end goal. So the main thing here was defining the priority of using this technology. Те технологии, которые нужны для того, чтобы долететь до Луны и остаться на ней длительное время, во многом недостаточно достигнуты или исследуются в рамках 
наземных экспериментов и полетах на низкую колоземную орбиту. And what we discovered is the matrix is mostly in the red, which means that the technologies needed most to fly to the moon and to stay there are the ones that are not getting enough development and not, not researched enough in the near Earth orbit. И анализируя, почему так произошло, пришли к выводу, что, к сожалению, наука, медицинская, медико-биологическая наука недостаточно управляли. Я понимаю, это звучит достаточно странно, но прикладной наукой, да, экспериментами, что нужно управлять, нужно ставить четкие задачи. And when we started to think about why this happened, it turned out that medical and biological scientists, sciences and the experiments done therein were not managed well. And it may sound a little strange, but you do really need to manage the research and steer it in the right direction. Да, потому что долгие годы, ну и сейчас это продолжается, что станция работает как лаборатория, международная лаборатория, предоставляя возможность ученым удовлетворять их научные интересы. Uh, because over the years, the ISS has served as an international laboratory that allows researchers to search answers to their own questions. Но иногда интерес ученых, или зачастую интерес ученых, не отвечает нужным прикладной космонавтике и для решения конкретных задач. But oftentimes, the interest of specific scientists does not collaborate or does not equal the needs that we have in order to explore space. Отсюда последний год, полтора, проводится активная работа в Роскосмосе в пересмотре процедуры формирования научной программы на борту Международной космической станции. И как результат этого, для того, чтобы к моменту планируемого полетов на, на, лун, на поверхность Луны, а, космическая медицина могла ответить, закрыть все необходимые риски и опасности, которые здесь были описаны. In order to be ready by the time it is flight to the moon, to have all of the risks and hazards addressed, all these risks that have been described today. Это все, что я хотел сказать. Thank you for your attention. Yes, yes. Thank you. And uh, uh, Dr. McKay? Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Chiaki McKay from Japan, and using this opportunity, I'd like to introduce some of the JAXA's activities related to the space biomedical research including the operational medicine and also the future research uh, direction. And the JAXA has a J, we call the JSUBRO, JAXA Space Biomedical Research Office, which is very small version compared to the John Charles mentioned, the HRP in NASA and the uh, IBPM in Russia. But we have five areas currently using the uh, International Space Station and doing some basic research as well as the operational research. And I believe even if we continue to uh, explore Moon or Mars, this five area will continue. So the five area includes physiological countermeasures like bone and muscle issue, like bisphosphonate to prevent the bone uh, absorption. And then second one is the psychological uh, support And the third one, and it's going to be very important one, is the radiation. And the radiation, we have the uh, development of the measurement system, and both passive system as well as the uh, active real-time monitoring system, I hope, especially from the moon surface, and also the biological effect, including the, uh, the genetic and the cancer risk, etc., is also interesting. And using some mathematics simulation, the protection method uh, using some special material uh, that, that kind is also uh, being uh, uh, researched. 
And then the fourth uh, area is this environmental issue, including bacterial changes on the, the skin, uh, uh, skin flora, or uh, hopefully in future helping for the hygiene system, because bacteria might have some, may have some toxicities and also has some different resistance uh, when bacteria is exposed by the cosmic radiation. And also environmental issue, we are interested in the lighting or uh, shift work or uh, sleep uh, the study issue, uh, sleep study, because this, uh, this also keep, keeps the astronaut uh, work environment very good and effective work that uh, we have to give them a good environment for sleep as well as the work shift. And the fifth part is also very important, this, uh, uh, developing the medical device, but actually not developing, but applying the uh, commercialized uh, device uh, converted into the space use, like a small device of the uh, electro uh, the ECG monitoring system, etc. Because we have a lot of very small, uh, the good commercialized medical device, which we can ap apply to the moon or Mars. So these five will, uh, will continue. And also a few years ago, the JAXA established the Lunar Frontier Medicine, which uh, uh, reinforced these five areas and also added the different ones. The one, the uh, reinforced area is the radiation, because we really need to understand the radiation effect and do the monitoring system. So the radiation is the one of the most interest from the viewpoint of operation. And also the rigorous, the moon dust effect on the lung respiratory system and skin itching or eye damages, etc. So the rigorous uh, effect on the human body is also interested in uh, the area. And then, uh, the, as John Charles mentioned, uh, the, uh, we are also very much interested in the partial G, partial gravity the research. This is more uh, the basic research area rather than the space medicine operational area. But interestingly enough, I flew uh, 1994, International Space uh, IML2, International IM, <laughs> International oh, Microgravity, yes, thank you, John. That's a long time ago, sorry. <laughs> IML2, then International Microgravity, the second mission, which 50% of the payload ca uh, came from Europe. And then the one of the payload we call the Nitsemi is German, the DLR developed uh, the device, and then it gives us the slow rotating microscope as well as a macroscope so that we can detect about the G threshold. And then we brought some maybe eight or uh, nine different species and uh, uh, the root or etc. And interestingly enough, seems like quite a lot of uh, the, the life forms have a G threshold between 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. That's what uh, uh, the researchers find it out. And even interesting thing is, as uh, John, John Charles mentioned, moon gravity is 1.6 G, which is 0 0.16 G. So I believe uh, moon uh, gravity, 1.6 G, is under threshold. So which means we need artificial gravity to develop if we long enough to stay on the moon's surface. But in, again, the, the scientifically interesting thing is we, do, we don't know how much gravity is necessary to maintain our life forms. We may, it may not be 1G, because here 1G, no choice for us. That's why we adapt ourselves to 1G. But maybe above the threshold, like 0.3G, maybe the short duration, uh, the, the G stimulation uh, will be enough to uh, maintain our body system. That is the part that we are very much interested in. So the 
uh, partially to uh, develop the artificial gravity device uh, using the moon experiment. And then I, the, the last thing is, is that I just want to uh, introduce some jacks as a very interesting mice facility, which is to support the partial G research. Because JAXA has uh, mice, uh, the six mice and six, uh, the two set of uh, mice facility. And one facility contains six mice. And then uh, you can do the static control under the uh, International Space Station, which is zero-G, so the static. And also, thanks to the uh, centrifugal force, you can give some partial G as you like. And then this is the one that you can detect the whole body uh, the reaction from the partial G, uh, the gravity, the gravitational uh, area. So that ISS will be a very good test bed for us to prepare for the moon uh, uh, research. So, so far, the three missions of the MICE uh, facility has already, already flown. This is a static and also the 1G control under the uh, zero G and the International Space Station. And then the, the fourth mission, uh, the microgravity, which is targeting on the 16G, is now ongoing. So I think we will be able to get the very interesting uh, information if 16G is good enough for us or not. So, so Chiaki brought up uh, a very important point that pivots back to what uh, Dr. John Charles showed, and that's the big question mark, where are the thresholds for bone loss for all of these other effects? And as we uh, continue on the space station, we can do quite a bit of that work, at least with, with uh, small mammals. So, so Andre Kiopers, uh, has he needs the clicker down there. So Andre, of course, is a physician. Uh, Andre was also part of the executive committee uh, back in uh, both Toulouse and, uh, and Belarus. And we worked together on a, uh, a statement through ASC uh, to talk about the collection or the, the need to collect uh, retired astronaut data. But as a practicing physician and having flown in space, uh, I was very interested in some of your perspectives on the, on the European side and the research that you know about and where you think some of the needs are. Now it, should, now it works. Um, also from an astronaut perspective, from a LEO astronaut perspective, low Earth orbit, and I will, I will do this now in a, in a we make a trip, say to Mars, in the form of pictures. Here we see the space station, um, uh, and then we could go to the moon, but let's go to Mars. Then we get a lot of problems because all of a sudden, a lot of things that I was used to in lowered orbit, we don't have anymore. All these, these, these great people at Mission Control, you are a team at Mission Control, and then you have to mo more do it alone. So it will be the operational task, etc. will be much more that we do it as a, as a team on board. And so that means that we need even more in-depth knowledge of uh, all the systems on board of all the procedures and how you find your trouble. Now we can use a lot the help of the, of the people on the, on the ground. Uh, we have to make very, be very sure that we keep the station in good shape, keep it clean. And, uh, and uh, because, uh, yeah, we cannot just go back. God can just help. So maintenance, repairs, inspections becoming more and more important. So the normal things like the environmental health system, you don't want uh, microbes in your, in, your, uh, in your water, for example. That becomes more and more important. The water. So now we can well, we recycle the water as much as possible. But if things break down, we have this beautiful eagles system. I love it. But it becomes more and more important if you're up there. You cannot get your support from the ground. So repairs are becoming important. And uh, uh, things will break down for sure. It breaks down in the station. But on our way to Mars, you, you, don't, you don't have easy access. Uh, so I think the 3D printer we have now will become a very important one. Uh, and then, of course, things go wrong. Emergencies, warnings, it happens all the time. And 
It, no, now this this happens on our flight. Uh, you get a lot of help from the people in uh, on mission control, of course. They know it probably before you. Uh, so, but then you have to do a lot of these things alone. You might get a fire. You might get problems with ammonia or whatever we will use with toxic atmosphere. We might get an impact. And then you have to be very sure that your space station doesn't look like the mirror in the old days. If you can close the hatches. Uh, so this is important. We get our drills, but they become more and more important to have your, your drills on these long duration flights and uh, uh, for all the different emergencies that, uh, that can occur. Uh, we heard it already, decompression sickness can of course occur. Uh, this is an, a maximum exercise test. You do this only when you have contact with the ground, so they can see your ECG, they can see your face. But if you would do these kind of things uh, on the way to Mars, it might be very different. So this the medical training becomes also very important. Um, because there's nobody, uh, also not even the people, the, 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 the crew searches of the ground, on the ground, they cannot easily help you with cameras. That was a bit too fast. But this is the question. Yes, you're there. And Claudia is there also. The next question is, should we send on a flight always? Uh, I heard yesterday that there's a big percentage of the astronauts is medical doctor nowadays. Is it an idea to send uh, on every flight a physician on board? Uh, it could be uh, an interesting option to do that. And actually can be handy for other things as well. This is a medical kit that I show this because I use the stethoscope as an MD and a uh, crew medical officer. What happened? Uh, the ATP was docked and we had to open the hatch and we couldn't get the hatch open. So I used the stethoscope to listen to the mechanism and I thought, well, it's just working. So we, had to, we, we got a third crew member and we finally got it open. So we had a diagnosis in space, be it on a hatch, but I have my medical diagnosis. It's sometimes very handy to have a physician on board. So the medication we heard already, radiation could damage the medication, can, could even be toxic. So that's big, a big issue, I think. Uh, for uh, for this long term, you cannot replace. I replaced a lot of medication when I was aboard. You get new medication, but then you cannot do that. And then, of course, the physiological effects. Over time, we get all these different physiological effects, and the big ones are, of course, in the long run. Here, Polyakov, what is it? For 37 days in space, very uh, very important uh, work to see what you can do against all these detrimental effects on the muscle, of course, especially the extensors. And one of the, uh, so we see a lot of changes already. You were lying in your bed for half a year. Especially the heart is, of course, important. Uh, the heart muscles, so we have to do a lot of exercise to keep that in good shape. It becomes very important. But do you still want it? I thought it was sometimes a bit annoying. I oh, have to do exercise again. I want to do something else. But on a way, trip to Mars, very important stuff. And, of course, the bone. The matrix, osteoporosis. Uh, with uh, cases of 25% loss, uh, if you work very hard, you still have uh, some, some, some 3 to 5% loss. So this is a beautiful piece of equipment, the ARED, but very big, very heavy. So if you want to, to do something light, so ESA is developing this E4D, for E's for European Exploration Enhanced Exercise Device, then it's uh, a company making this light and can do 29 different ways of exercise. So these are interesting things to, to send up. It has to be light, it has to be effective. And maybe we should revive this kind of technology. I love this as a kid, so you just create your own gravity by rotating spaceships. So it's be far, of, far away from that, I guess, but that would be a very nice way to do it. And then, of course, we heard it already, um, the solar particle events. Here we see nicely how, how active our sun is. Um, I don't go deep in that, but on Mars, no magnetic field. On the way to Mars, no problem. So you get problems in your chromosomes. Um, and uh, so this, we did a lot of these uh, installations as well from the equipment uh, of uh, tests and dosimeters. Radiation is one of the big issues uh, that we heard already. We will be hearing more of that. Is this experiment Altea to see which equipment helps protect best against the radiation. And then the results of that, cataract, uh, for example. So I, the eyes, I was, I was also on the summit, and the eye is becoming a more and more important uh, issue, of course. Uh, um, and we did all these interesting uh, results with, well, this is the present problem, the disc edema, um, and see what we can do uh, against that, or avoid that, or counteract that. So this kind of research will be very important for this long travel to Mars. So also important, we have to be healthy when we go there, in good shape. So the, the medical tests before are very important. And then you have all these blood samples. But if you want to do it in space, 
you need, you don't have all this big equipment. So uh, it becomes important, well, big centrifuge, we put it in a freezer, and then we wait for a spaceship to bring it back. It's not possible if you're on your way to Mars. So this kind of equipment, uh, to make it small, you have your mini lab on board and make all the analysis. So that, that, these are very interesting developments. And what Europe is doing more, well, we, I, saw, I showed the A4D, of course, but uh, there's, they're working on an integrated hub uh, system to put all the medical equipment in one place so you can get uh, good data from all sides. Food packaging, uh, the food is becoming important. Nutritional database. Now the crew surgeon can tell you, well, you have to eat more of that and more of that. But then a computer has to do it for you. AI becomes important. And, of course, what kind of exercise we need. And then, of course, psychology. This is great to look at the Earth, and you're very close. If it's, a, if it's a problem, you go back very quickly. We don't have that anymore. Contact with the ground, well, we have it now, a lot. I, I called my wife more in space than on the ground, because, because no, I was not in Japan or Houston and, and here in Holland. So, but you cannot do that, not anymore so much. You know, all these this, uh, this family conferences are very important for the psyche on board. So... Uh, the crowd, uh, what becomes your family is the crew. They become more and more your family. We heard it already. We're all family. But that becomes very important because the family at home, well, you cannot read so easily. So entertainment is very important. And have a nice time on board as well. And I advise that you should also have all, not only physician astronauts, but also musician astronauts on board. So you have, uh, you have a good uh, entertainment. Uh, and, of course, we heard it already, sleep. Of course, important for everybody, but also on board, important to sleep and, and amusement. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and then privacy. Uh, that's also something you want to withdraw now and then. And sometimes I had the feeling on board there was some kind of Big Brother show. I show this. This is a picture from NASA TV because once I floated through the, the, the cabin and I thought I'm going to call my, my, my cousin. Uh, and he said, oh, nice, I just saw you on, uh, in, uh, on, uh, on the screen. I said, which, which TV program? No, no, he said, live on Internet. He said, what, live on Internet? And I re didn't realize that the cameras are put on. Sometimes you're streamed, uh, so you all of a sudden realize that everybody is looking at you. And that's, that's just something you want to be private as well now and then. So important that the people have their own cabins. And then food. Uh, food is, of course, very important. It has to be, it tastes good, smell good. Um, and these sessions are very nice in Russia and the States. And uh, try your food that has to, have, the, your bonus food is nice. And look at all these faces, you know. Everybody is happy when you get some fresh food. You cannot have that anymore. Now they can go to the market in Boykin and Boykin put something in a progress. But this will be difficult to get your fresh food. So the, the food department, food is becoming a very important issue on, uh, on these long travels. Uh, it will not, uh, well, this is swordfish, I think. Uh, so, who knows, but uh, it, it will be very important. You want to have nice food, you want to relax. And then, finally, you reach Mars, and then you have another problem, even though it's one-third of gravity. Uh, this is a viral, uh, the viral reflect, uh, reflection test. Uh, you get problems with, uh, with the fact that you have been lying in your bed for half a year. Uh, the blood pressure reflexes are bad. So now we have, of course, uh, the, the Kent Tower and uh, the LBMP devices. Um, will be caused also with one third gravity. And when you land, there's not this big team of people there for you. There's nobody to put you nicely in a chair and take care of you, and the doctors around you, and they take your pulse and they clean up your parachute, and put you in a medical tent. You don't have that anymore. So they carry you in a, a helicopter. Well, that will be interesting. So that's interesting. I don't know what the future will look like for space flight on the moon or on Mars or something like this, but what I know is that the medical aspects will be very important. I love this cover of the Nikogosian book. Uh, this will be also the future of space flight. Things will happen, and we need all this medical support. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of it we have to do ourselves. Thank you. So, Dr. Bloomfield. inviting me, as I don't know, um, to join this panel. I'm honored to join this distinguished group. Um, my academic training is in integrative physiology. Um, most of my career I've focused on bone health issues related to disuse and long-term um, unloading of spaceflight. But I've had the opportunity over the past few years that started with working, actually, with 
Dr. Dunbar on a National Academy Committee that advises NASA's medical um, officer, chief medical officer. It's a, a committee that goes by the acronym of CAMI, but it's concerned with um, protecting the health of both active and retired crew. Um, and in meetings a couple years ago, the issue of this TREAT Act came up, legislation passed by the U.S. Congress after many years of recommendations from this committee and others to provide um, health care for retired crew at the very least for those conditions that might be space related, related to their time spent in space. The difficulty here is in defining what health conditions at the age of 50, 60, or 70 might be space related. We don't have enough data to well define that yet. Um, you've also heard um, mentioned, well, in fact, you, many of you here participated last year in passing your consensus statement um, indicating your willingness as retired crew to share your health and medical data if it were handled in a responsible, secure fashion and used by researchers to help define what might be conditions that are related to your time spent in the space environment. Um, so it's clear that we must come up with some better mechanisms to um, enable researchers to define those space-related conditions. And if you're familiar with the field of epidemiology, you know that they often have to um, study some thousands of people and compare it with the appropriate control group to determine is this risk of cancer or um, um, heart disease or any other condition um, reliably related to some previous exposure and in this case space. Uh, so working, oh, let's click through real fast. Um, Working together with Dr. Dunbar, we have started work on a feasibility study to see how we might better achieve this data collection towards this end so that not only can we um, ensure the correct implementation of this TREAT Act for retired crew, but also to define the risks for uh, current and future uh, crew members as they head into space? Do we need specific, uh, is there a priority to certain countermeasures that we need to focus on? So this feasibility study that we're going by the acronym of RADAR um, uh, has that as its goal. Um, many of you American crew know that the longitudinal study on astronaut health collects your data now from your annual exams and will accept data from doctor visits, hospital stays, serious diagnoses, but there are some challenges in collecting that data. Anyone here, at least in our, our decentralized American healthcare system, knows how complicated it can be to request information from your doctor's office or from the hospital, or, um, and especially if you're dealing with multiple entities. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, and also, to our knowledge, we're not aware of any systematic collection of data from um, crew other than the Americans and Canadians that are served by this LSAH -L um, data repository. And also, it's important to remember that um, time is a, of the essence here. Um, we're all getting older. <laughs> And I certainly hope that no one in this room passes away in the near future, but we have an aging population and some 28% of surviving crew members, I think this is American crew data, are now over 70 years of age. So this is getting to be a time urgent issue. So the aims of this feasibility study that's been funded by the Translational Research Institute for Space Health um, also linked to NASA, um, is aiming to first gather your input uh, with a survey that we'll be distributing here on Friday that is going to directly inform um, some of the next steps in this project. Um, so I, I urge your um, participation in taking this survey. It's a quick 10 or 15 minute effort. Um, and once we have those data, 
we're going to use those in working with our industry consultant, B. Prescient out of Boston, to customize or, or to help in the selection of um, a, a product, a personal health record, uh, an electronic um, software that can be used to easily collect your data from your physician, your uh, hospital stay, multiple sources, and um, then in an easy and convenient manner, transmit that data to um, a, a data repository that would be accepting that information. So your input is real important in helping us do that next step in what are the product requirements that we have to search out for that kind of platform. In the ideal world, this will be something that can be on your smartphone that if you have with you at your doctor's office or leaving the hospital, you can say, please download my data, and I have it, and now I have control over it to release it to the, the um, uh, responsible data collectors. Um, so our final goal with this one-year feasibility study, then, is to take um, this prototype personal health uh, platform and try it out with 10 or 12 retired crew members, probably from the U.S. with a system that we know here pretty well, and see how well that works before we progress to um, our long-term goals to use these findings to um, create a larger, more comprehensive project, um, which, as we're appreciating, is more and more complicated, um, but to build a data repository um, um, at Texas A&M to collect data from international crew for anyone who does not now have um, a place to send their data. Um, and then, finally, if I can get this up. So, um, but overall, creating an easy and convenient method for those of you who feel strongly about this, about the need to collect um, your medical data, your health records, so that we can better determine what are those critical space-related conditions. This will have some benefit to you if, if, if you're collecting your medical data more easily, but clearly the long-term outcomes are better protection of future astronaut health um, if we know the conditions that tend to um, crop up more frequently in those of you who spent time in the space environment. Uh, you see our radar team listed there, and um, we have the help of John Charles as a consultant um, and our industry partner in Boston, B. Prescient. Uh, so we urge you to return that survey after a quick 10 or 15 minutes, and um, we pledge to move forward with your important input to get these goals accomplished. Thank you. Uh, we'll have an opportunity on Friday uh, at our, uh, our meeting to talk a little bit more about this. But uh, I'd like to move on to some technology now, uh, especially related to astronaut protection for radiation environments. And so with that, uh, I'll introduce uh, Kat Kodera from Lockheed Martin. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, as uh, Bonnie introduced, I'm Kat Coderre from Lockheed Martin. I am uh, our project manager on the, on the Lockheed Martin side for the Astrorad Vest. And uh, let me give a quick overview. It's actually uh, the engineering unit is sitting right behind Dr. Charles um, of the Vest. So uh, this was actually a partnership. It's an international collaboration, uh, predominantly uh, between Lockheed Martin and an Israeli-based company called STEMRAD. Uh, what you see here in this uh, image is uh, the CEO of STEMRAD, um, Oren uh, Milstein, and uh, the Director General of the Israeli Space Agency. Before I get into details on the vest and kind of what it does and what it's meant to protect, um, the, the protection uh, technology actually has heritage here on Earth. Uh, the STEMRAD team actually developed a terrestrial-based uh, protection system uh, to actually protect against uh, nuclear uh, and radiological uh, disasters, predominantly for first responders. Um, so this is kind of where the vest started. They actually used uh, on that and on the Astrorad, the uh, in-space design, a, uh, a selective shielding technology, and actually the first company to uh, 
uh, come up with that and actually put it into action. And you can see here the different uh, colors are actually different uh, types of uh, thicknesses and different uh, application for the shielding to protect those uh, particular regions of the pelvic region there um, for this particular uh, STEMRAD 360, which is one of their terrestrial vests for um, Earth-based protection. The actual AstroRad vest um, that you see here is uh, predominantly, it is designed to protect against uh, those SPEs, those solar particle events in the deep space environment. Um, it uses that sh selective shielding uh, algorithm um, that was developed, um, which actually helps, which is used in combination with, um, it actually complements the body's self-shielding as well. Um, it uh, also, it, like I said, it is designed for solar particle events. And you can see kind of a similar kind of color shading there. Um, we're actually focusing the, the first initial tests on female test subjects. Uh, and, uh, and that is because of the sensitivity to uh, radiation for that gender. I don't have any samples on me, but this is what the internal structure actually looks like of the vest. So uh, you're looking at low Z materials, so trying to get as much hydrogen between you and uh, the particles as possible. Um, and it's a lot more lighter weight um, than those, uh, the, than a material such as lead. And um, it basically, the internal structure of the vest is like thousands of these small little, um, tessellated hexagons that are interlocked, um, that have these caps and these interlockings. So you actually have a lot of, a surprising amount of uh, flexibility in the design, much more than you would think by just kind of wearing some uh, high density polyethylene. Um, and uh, so that allows for a lot more of the movement. The thickness varies um, dependent on, on the physiology and the actual, um, the subject. So um, it, I think we're as small as a couple of millimeters up to uh, several centimeters um, in thickness in some places, depending on the gender and the subject. And so this mapping is done and that thickness goes according to um, that person. So we actually have a great opportunity to fly uh, two different experiments uh, with the vest. One is actually on the International Space Station uh, which I'll talk about first. Uh, the second one is on the Orion Artemis 1 mission. So we're looking at, um, from the, the CHARGE experiment, uh, Comfort in Human Factors Asteroid Radiation Garment Evaluation, because this is space, so everything has to be an acronym. Um, so what we're really looking here is actually not how it performs from the radiation protection, because it's a different environment than what our goal of the deep space environment is. This is actually an ergonomic experiment. So we want to make sure that it's comfortable and doesn't restrict movement um, or restrict movement as little as possible uh, because the crew uh, case would be in deep space. We want to be able to actually ensure that the crew can wear it comfortably, do their duties in a small confined environment, and actually even be able to don and doff it easily. It doesn't ride up. Um, th things along those lines. So what we're doing on the space station, we actually uh, we're on the NG-12 uh, launch on the 2nd of November. And uh, so the, the goal really there is that we, uh, we have the crew do a, a various a, a set list of tasks, which really just align with some of their normal everyday um, tasks, and uh, including a range of motion um, test at the, at the very beginning so that we can actually cap capture with and without the vest uh, the range of motion and try and see how that impacts um, in the microgravity environment. Uh, we even are looking at um, having them uh, do different exercises with it. We've done some ground trials already uh, to see what uh, types of exercise are, are more um, doable while wearing the vest in the environment. So that's the uh, charge experiment. And uh, we've done a couple of different kind of ground trials too. Um, I put my picture of me actually wearing that article right there. Um, so we did some testing down at Kennedy Space Center in one of the um, the Lockheed Martin Habitat for Deep Space uh, Habitat Ground Test Articles. MARE, so the, the second experiment that we're actually flying the vest is on Orion Artemis 1, the Matryoshka Asteroid Radiation Experiment. So this one we have is where we're actually testing for uh, the three week duration of Orion in the deep space environment. Um, we have one control, so that's a, a, a phantom that has active and passive dosimeters, and the other one is actually being worn by the vest. So we'll be able to actually get some good data on the actual environment. 
Uh, and we've just, uh, I've got a couple of uh, charts here with the Orion storm shelter. So again, the idea of getting as much stuff between you and the radiation as possible. And the storm shelter on Orion um, is actually pretty small. So you can kind of see here where we actually had some mock-ups of the vest and some people wearing it kind of inside the shelter as well to provide for some extra protection. And that's it. So thank you very much to the panel. And we'll take some questions now. This one right in front. Okay. I guess I'll go first. <laughs> uh, actually, this question is for you, Chiaki. Uh, you, you mentioned an experiment where, if I understood it correctly, there was some centrifugal force being used to determine the low end or, or plateaus, potentially, of uh, biological activity. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to square that with what I've also seen recently, where um, in zero gravity on the ISS, uh, some green leafy plants were grown and consumed. Uh, but you mentioned that this might be relevant to growing your food supply, for example, in the one-sixth gravity of the moon. So can you tell me a little bit more about that experiment and how you relate that experiment to what was recently done on the ISS and, and what you think will happen with uh, what the next experiment should be done for food supply? Food supply? Food supply? Uh, the food, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the food, talking about the food, there's a plant uh, sample. And then you know that uh, in the microgravity, the root doesn't know where to go. But the root has some kind of uh, status. It's a very small stone which detects the threshold or the gravity. And then the even root to 0.2 to 0.3 G will be the threshold. So if you apply that threshold, uh, the G, and then the root goes toward that situation. So the gravity is one of them, and also hydro, uh, the root loves water. So the, it goes to the water too. So we can control these two for future uh, plants. And also the electrical field is the one that uh, researchers are looking for. So the moon, we need that kind of special environment to root to maybe go to the special direction. That's what we are thinking. Thank you. We had another one? Uh, yes. Would someone speak to the impact of the reduction of the human immune system? And, and where does that stand as a potential problem in the future with long flights at no gravity? your question. Uh, there are a lot of things like immune, for example, bacteria, we've seen some change in, in virulence in various bacteria. We've started Clarence Sams and other people. In fact, Richard Garriott participated in one of the experience, experiments looking at immune function, and immune function seems to be somewhat impaired in spaceflight, no doubt. The question, though, more than I have is, so far, these things haven't been clinically significant. That doesn't mean that they won't be. But we have a lot of things where there's a tendency to, you see decline, you see the bacterial virulence, but we haven't seen the illness that comes from that. That doesn't mean it won't happen. We, we follow a lot of things that we thought were okay, then it turns out later they weren't. But the, it, it is impaired. What it means, I think, is yet to be determined. John probably knows more about that than I do. Just a, a real quick uh, addition to what Richard is saying. On the year-long expedition of Scott Kelly, uh, there were immune studies done as part of the twin study, and that involved uh, taking the, the flu vaccine before flight, then the same one during flight, then the same one again after flight. And the in-flight and the post-flight responses of the immune system of, of Scott Kelly to the, the flu vaccine 
were the same. So at least in that one instance of that one component of the immune system, there did not seem to, did not seem to be a detrimental effect of space flight. But there are other areas, and uh, the clinicians are, are looking at things like skin conditions on the space station right now, which may be related to differences in immune function in space flight. So the immune system is complex and multivariate, and uh, no answers, no easy answers on that yet. I want to ask, okay. If we all agree to give you all the international flyers, uh, the physiological data into a database, as you suggest, who would be uh, uh, eligible to utilize the data? Is this just JSC or is it uh, worldwide open, this database? I think that is an important question uh, that should be answered before we actually go for that. Uh, absolutely, I agree, that's critical. No, I think the goal is to operate much as the longitudinal study of astronaut health works in that the data are stored in a secure fashion. We have to follow all our local HIPAA regulations and that the ultimate goal will be that qualified researchers who um, come up with a, a well-designed study to ask a specific question. If for an example, do um, astronauts, cosmonauts over the age of 70 have a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease events? Um, and, and by applying the appropriate control group, maybe come up with a, a better answer to that question than we have now. Um, so yes, the access would only be by qualified researchers who go through a vetted process, much like our LSAH um, project here at NASA. Uh, in does that help answer your question? But who qualifies the researchers? I'm sorry? <laughs> okay, you said you would give access to qualified researchers. But here comes the next question. Who is the institution who qualifies the researchers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is my mic on? Okay. So that's a really good question, Ulf, and that's what this feasibility study is all about. We're not to that point yet. You know, we, there was an interest to find out a way for the international community to contribute to something like we have in the United States, the Longitudinal Surveillance of Astronaut Health, in which there is a process which funded researchers uh, qualified can access data. And so the first feasibility study is what are the road bumps to do that? What are the, we've got, if we have a public health lawyer involved. Uh, what are the legal challenges of trying to, if, if a European astronaut or a Japanese astronaut or, or a, a, a Russian cosmonaut wanted to pull into this data, what would be the impediments? This is being discussed at the International Space Medicine Summit, which has all of the uh, international partners of the space station involved, all of the lead medical researchers as well as flight surgeons and so forth. And we don't have that answer yet. The survey is trying to help us understand how we can actually come to that answer. But ultimately, the goal is certainly to have it as protected or, or as best protected as we have uh, current databases now with the goal of answering the critical questions, you know, what are the effects of space flight? How does that inform us to have better health care and how does it protect future explorers? If I can add to that, um, I think what your question was, well, who will qualify these researchers? What, how will they be vetted? And I think with our, our, our standard peer review process that I think is very common across the world in the, um, is that a peer of, of a panel of peers, well-trained people in that area, are evaluating the whole study, what the qualifications of the investigators, do they have adequate institutional support, what, will they be successful in this project and handle it in a responsible manner. So the peer review process, I think, will, will help define who's a qualified researcher. Okay, let's have one, one more. Go ahead, Billy. How do you currently uh, um, identify uh, people now in, on the U.S. side, do you have them by name, by uh, de-identified code? How do you do it? Yeah, can you answer that? Are you asking how LSAH yes. works? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Charles is probably the expert here, but my understanding is that um, all that data is entered um, into their database. Um, to track you long term, they have to link it to your personal information, right? 
But then when it, a researcher comes to ask for those data, um, I, there has to be a process to de-identify the data. And in fact, um, that might have to happen before it's even released. So that it's just clumped by, I mean, that your demographic data would be there. These are females, these are people over 60, what, you know, whatever the key um, issues are. But does that get to your question? Well, it has long-term implications as far as insurance for the younger flyers after they uh, get out. If the information gets out, then it could have Melanie, the, mm -hmm. I think that's a really good question for the, the existing LSH folks because it's been in existence for over a decade. And uh, those of us, when you go into your, for your flight physical after retirement, that's where the data goes. And then they uh, uh, have, uh, they do blinded studies to determine, for example, uh, I remember it was LSH, I think, that actually showed that the iodine in our water could have, be linked to thyroid problems, remember? And then we stopped using iodine in our, our drinking water. So I don't think we have anybody here that can talk about the existing program. But I will tell you that we knew it as Wiley, and now it is uh, KBR has taken over. Uh, so it's the KBR Longitudinal Surveillance Astronaut Health. And uh, that's something you, you know, if you want to link to the next time you do link, flight physical is a perfect group to go to. Uh, the other question is to John and to Jackie. Um, the fractional gravity is a really interesting question. Have you also thought of fractional intermittent gravity? Because it's possible that you only need like 0.4, right? But you only need it for two hours or four hours. Just a brief. Just briefly, that is also one of the protocol. The total amount of the stimulation can be uh, modulated by the duration of the time as well as the max. Uh, so that is also the one that you, we have to uh, the, the investigate more. So I think we'll wrap it up here. I will uh, make one more note. Uh, NASA and Texas A&M are teaming up to bring uh, the uh, human related centrifuge, which was at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. Uh, we're bringing it to Texas A&M and building a facility for it, so we'll start to investigate just exactly what you're talking about, Melly, the fractional G environments as well as the intermittent, intermittent G, G environments, cardiovascular, uh, whatever we can get from both, uh, bed rest co coupled with the centrifugal uh, forces. So let's give our panel a round of applause. And thank you very much. So we are now going to exit to the buses through this door. You cut across uh, the astronaut gallery, go out the red carpet, and presumably our buses will be there. Take you back to the hotel. <laughs>